to refer to that as our engagement. Um, so just the internal arrangement, um, everybody that is parking will be a free spot to the area that is demarcated uh, as parking for public prosecutors. So here we have the parking reserve for public prosecutors, that's where you can park for your charge. If you're going to park outside, Area, you will have to pay for your internet. So, two o'clock, so it's going to cost you 240 rand. I don't have 240 rand, so please don't come and make a loan. You don't have 240, you will have to get your car impounded. So, please make sure that you are ready and we will start 845 on the dock. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is 8:46. We said that we're going to address the time we punctual because there are people online waiting for us, and then they sit for hours and hours waiting for us, and that's not going to happen this year. Welcome to the first installment of the NPA uh, Soccer Community Dialogue for 2023. Um, my name is Mr. Advocate Dion Arikas. I'm the Senior Prosecutor uh, dealing with maintenance in the Western Cape. I'm also uh, in the soccer unit. Soccer is a sexual offenses and community affairs unit, and we deal with sexual offenses, human trafficking, domestic violence, maintenance, child justice, 
um, and uh, all of those things related to gender-based violence and femicide, that is our core focus area. Uh, I think what you can hear me, um, but I'll try and if anyone don't, can't hear me clearly, just indicate and then I will try and uh, speak a little bit louder for all of you to be able to hear. So we are then starting off with the KPA community dialogue on maintenance today. And uh, the theme for this year will be uh, dealing with all of these different types of challenges that uh, mothers face in the uh, maintenance course pertaining to maintenance. Um, I will, towards the end of today, give a a uh, breakdown of what we are planning for the whole year, but for now, uh, let us uh, just uh, focus on our introduction. Uh, all of you will have a, a copy of a um, handout. Uh, it is uh, 84 pages and 84 pages of information that you will take along with you. The online viewers also uh, will be able to get to the um, handout online. Uh, you did the thing this last night. If anyone would like to uh, obtain a copy, please send an email to www.childmaintenance.org.za. There is a website, www.childmaintenance.org.za, where you can get a lot of information on maintenance methods. There's a lot of affidavits, all the maintenance application forms are there, and all of those things you will be able to access on www.childmaintenance.org.za. There is a WhatsApp group that Mr. Eugene Overman started, where we are assisting uh, more than 368 women uh, that are here interested on that group, and daily we are trying to assist women um, and mothers on that group to be able to information that they were able to use. Please take the down your, uh, your copy. Uh, it costs a lot to print it. If it's not of use to you, please send it to your neighbor or to somebody in your church or to somebody else. But please don't put it in the toilet and carry it on it or throw it in the dustbin. It doesn't belong there. It's important information that took hours to complete. So you can at least show some sort of honor towards it just give it to somebody else if you don't find any need in it. On the first page, you have the program for today. Um, the uh, speakers, uh, most of them are here. Mr. Peters is just a little bit delayed on the end, but he's on his way. Mr. Quinton Zimmerman is over here. Mr. Eugene uh, Offerman is here. Um, Ms. Phil Wells is just having a, an issue of taking her son to a event, but she will be uh, here by uh, 10.15 o'clock. Uh, and I believe uh, Richard is over here as well as uh, Mr. Angus Steeler that is indicating over here that like, if he's too late, I will be doing uh, this presentation. Um, uh, um, Michaela Jackson is right at the back and uh, she will do a presentation on living wolves uh, today. Ms. Atkins, Lynn Mohammed, who have taken over the presentation of um, Ms. Roxanne Nansen. Uh, but she couldn't make it. Page 59 and page 60 is a stunning article that was published in the Derivatives uh, pertaining to lying in expenses. If um, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, 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 Mohammed is not going to be here, so I'll do the uh, lying in expenses, explaining what lying in expenses is in terms of section 16 1A and what it means. And uh, that is a stunning article. If you have some time, please read to it. Page 8 of the directors um, um, of December of 2022. Uh, if you can't, uh, just Google directors, D E R E V U S, and you will get all the different journal articles for the last. Um, 2013, so seven, nine year, uh, nine years, ten years, approximate. All of those you can download from the site if you want to. The scanner, we did ask for permission to print it. Right? This is very, very close to two people, so in the economy, so we did get permission to publish uh, the article on page 59 and page 60 of, uh, the, uh, of our handout. So we do have permission. Mr. Opperman has got a few articles 
quote what you want the court to do. Either you want the court to attach uh, asset, that is in terms of section 26, as well as section 27 of the maintenance act, or you want to attach emolument, <coughs> taking a salary or anything that you bank account with emolument, that is in terms of section 28 of the maintenance act. Alternatively, you want to attach a pension fund, that's in terms of section 30 of the uh, maintenance act. So, all my notes, an excellent article in the directors on BDB versus BDB saying that it's not in a, 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 a right that you have to notify the respondent at all times whenever you want to attach. There's always this notion among the magistrates, and you've seen these magistrates online, I just want to put it here out there. Section 28 of the Magnus Amendment Act, 1915. In a case where it is urgent and there is detriment, and that delay will be to the detriment of the child, and it's an unavisable delay, there's no reason why a court can't give an immediate um, emolument attachment order. That's in terms of section 28 of the Maintenance Amendment Act 1915. Please make a note of it. Because all our magistrates, you know, in not just our own set of rules, it's our magistrates making that mistake. Say that no, but it must be notified. You can't bring the ex parte case, and that's not true. So, if there's one thing that you take out of today that I think, not the one, but the one, people think now, what I think, then please remember that it's not necessary to notice, give notice in all cases. Section 28 of the Maintenance of Amendment Act 9 of 2015 is clear. When you determine if the delay is unreasonable, no need for it. Take that home. Oppermann's article, BDB versus BDB, says we have no right to get the respondent there because the respondent runs quickly to court when there's an attachment. They say, no, 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 but I didn't know about it. No need to judge a window in the BDB versus BDB case and say there's no automatic right to it. If it doesn't come, it in terms of section 64, it's his duty to inform us where he is. We're not going to run after him anymore. Fathers have this thing, they are right behind big walls. There's a case that was decided in December of this year in the Gauteng um, uh, High Court, where the Gauteng High Court said it's a vehicle, it's a vehicle that says if you hide behind the big security walls or if you hide on the farm where we can't get out of it to serve you and you think you're going to get away with it, in terms of section 64, there's a duty on you to provide that address. If you don't provide that address, it is not, not our baby, we still we attach. But you can come and come and ask for a season judgment, you can ask for amendment in that order, you can do all of that, it's on the form for the J4 and 5, come and do it. That's your uh, prerogative, but we're not going to wait for you to be attached, especially if it is to the detriment of that specific mother or that specific child. But this provision in section 24 that says that once the court makes an order, that order becomes like a civil judgment. So if that happens, why are we not using the National Trade Attack? So, Mr. Uh, 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 no, Mr. Lloyd, uh, uh, I was in time to explain it to me. Guys, and I said, okay, and I still didn't sit in with me. And then I went to a conference uh, of, uh, uh, I almost said, the uh, of social justice. And we must, I heard Mr. Twinder and Zimmerman speak. I had to have been in twice more than the time on this plan. And then I said, okay, Mr. Zimmerman, please come to the EPA dialogue and explain it to us again. But just go slower. Now, unfortunately, because of time constraints, Mr. Zimmerman couldn't go slow. And I had to somehow interject while he was presenting. And because of that, I decided it's important that we get this information and understand Section 24 in the way. These gentlemen understand it because I still really didn't understand it. And that's why everything is in the mess that they are. Because we do not use section 24. We want to use section 26, 27, 28, and section 30 of the maintenance maintenance Act. Instead of using the section 24 option, that's quick and easy. We prefer to go the long way. So hopefully Mr. Zimmerman will go slow so that I can listen to the other people to get it this time. Uh, because he's more, if you think, I've got energy in this man and start speaking. 
I attended a half the function after that, and Mr. Zimmerman was still going till 12 o'clock. <laughs> I was sitting very extremely hearing of all of um, how you attach, how the process work, uh, a colleague of our, ours, my kid, from all the way from the first state was sitting there. She got tired and she had to uh, 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 search after that. But let us just listen to Mr. Zimmerman. Mr. Zimmerman, I know we've said 35 minutes. Which is our, please take your time. We need to get to this message out there. After there will be time for questions. But if you want to ask questions, there will during the tea break, there will be an opportunity for you to speak to Mr. Zimmerman. Uh, his details are on the handout. Please make sure. If you need more information, you can speak to him um, via uh, email or the cell number is there, um, and he is more than willing to give uh, any of those information that you might need in order to be able to uh, understand uh, the process that is supposed to be followed whenever we are moving with uh, these type of matters in uh, the maintenance schools. So whenever there is a judgment or a so it's supposed to be a civil judgment. Section 24 is an option that we should use whenever dealing with these type of matters. Mr. Zimmerman, over to you, Maintenance uh, Act and the Plus Credit, but I refer to the National Credit Act. Right. Thank you, Dion. Just picking up Dion's interference with the cell phone. Good morning, everybody. My name is Quentin. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I feel like I'm like a superstar. I'm not. I'm just an attorney. Uh, I attend the magic school. I've also done a right of in the high school. So I, I litigate quite often in debt related matters. And I'm going to bring that expertise in terms of how it can apply to maintenance as well. Uh, just that everyone knows the hand up. It's, it's fantastic what, what, what you and have done here. Uh, everything that I'm going to be referring to is on page 45 to 49 of the hand up. So all the law. All the sections that I'm going to be relying upon and the regulations is on page 45 onwards. So I think I'm going to try and shorten it. And in terms of information that I'm going to be relaying to everyone, I'm not going to read out all the sections you have in front of you. So as we go through it, you can read it up, you can read it up, um, for yourself. I'm going to explain what it means. So sometimes it can be quite boring uh, to read all these various sections, and it seems like a little bit of legal terminology thrown in there. It's not written for the layperson. So let's speak about not what, what it says, but what it means practically if you have to go to court and you have to enforce your rights. What I've also said before, and I'm going to say it again, yes, uh, the country, this country is a complete mess at the moment. Uh, but what we don't realize is that South, South Africa has got some of the best laws in the world when it comes to protecting its citizens and its consumers. We've got the Constitution. We've got the National Credit Act that deals with, with anything to do with credit. We've got um, the Consumer Protection Act that deals with goods and services that you receive. We've got now the Copy Act and all those sort of all that legislation that's in place. So we're sitting here and we're complaining about how bad everything is, but we have the framework available to us to enforce our rights and ensure that we get what, what, what we are entitled to. It's just a matter of knowing what those rights are and knowing how and knowing how to ask for it. Being able to rely on the various sections of the, of the act that we have that are in place to protect us against the bad, bad world out there. Um, and that's what I'm going to come in today. So I'm going to focus today on the, on the National Credit Act and how it relates to maintenance. And uh, do you want to move it here? Or... Oh, okay. Okay, so like Yuan said earlier, um, a maintenance order has the exact same effect as a civil judgment. Now, that's great, but what does it mean? It means that a civil judgment is something that's enforceable. A civil judgment is something that can be, can, can be used to enforce something. A civil judgment is something that can inform the public that there is something outstanding, there's something granted against someone else. You should have the right to be able to access that information. So what is not happening in South Africa is all maintenance orders, when they are default, in other words, when it's not been satisfied for a period of 10 days or longer, they are not generally being listed on the credit bureaus. But as I'm going to go, go a little bit further, there's a right in terms of, not, not just the right, an obligation on the maintenance officer um, and on the courts and on the credit bureaus to have that information listed. 
So in other words, if it's a defaulting father, he doesn't pay his maintenance, that default, that maintenance order, it should be, it must be listed on the credit bureau in some shape or form. And that's going to become very significant in terms of what it means, practically speaking, going down the line, and how that to a great extent can help struggling mothers, struggling children, in terms of being able to not only have the right, but to be enforced in a practical and a realizable manner. And that's what I'll, I'll, I'll deal with shortly as well. Um, next slide. Um, sorry, am I going, am I going slow now? So far, okay, great. Um, in terms of what I just referred to, and again, as I said in the handout, I'm referring to the amendment to section 26, which is 26.2a um, and 26.2 big, big A. In terms of the fact of what happens when there's a default. When there's, when there's a default, again, I'm not going to read it out. You have it in the handout. What it means is the following. Is that judgment, in terms of defaulting maintenance payments, the maintenance officer can then refer a certified copy of that judgment to the credit bureau or to any institution that grants credit or rates or rates or rates credit in terms of in terms of consumers. And um, and provide the details of, of obviously the order and the details of the person that has defaulted in terms of the, of the maintenance. Why you need the details? Because obviously when you do a credit search, you you search on someone's ID number. So that order, that maintenance order has to be has to be registered at the credit bureau under the person's ID number. That becomes very significant when it comes to the granting of credit and what assessment needs to take place before any credit provider is able to grant credit to any person in the country. They have to do a credit check first. That's part of the assessment procedure. Um, unfortunately, as it currently stands, um, although we have an entrenched in the Act, uh, in practice, it's not happening that these orders are being submitted to, submit to the Federal Bureau. Uh, CPD, um, Sorry, there we go. Um, there, there, is, there are steps in, in terms of, 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 of trying to get these things listed. Um, and, and that's going to be very important down the line in terms of the effect it's going to have in terms of, in terms of the enforcement of maintenance orders and access to credit. Next slide. Again, in terms of section 31 -1, there's a, the, it's a offense not exceeding, uh, of not exceeding prison of three years in terms of anyone that uh, doesn't make the, make the payments in terms, in terms of maintenance order. Uh, and also, again, the... Section 31 4 was also amended. Now, there it is. Now, in terms of Section 31 4, it now says the maintenance office, officer shall, um, in the prescribed manner, furnish the person particulars and uh, to, to any business in the, in, the, in the granting of credit. Now, why that is significant is that that word shall was amended. It used to say may. Now, as a lawyer, one has to look at what the language is and what it means in terms of the interpretation. The word may, a maintenance officer may submit the information, means that there's a description. So when it says shall, that is another way of saying must. So although we have it as a must, it must be done. It's not really currently happening. So I'll have to speak to Dion in terms of what we need to do to uh, start getting these things implemented at the court level so that this provision in terms of this act and this amendment, or particularly done to change that one word, is actually fully enforced, which will have, which will have massive implications down the line in terms of, in terms of the enforcement of maintenance. Uh, next slide. The reason why I'm carrying on about this is because what it really comes down to when it comes to dealing with the National Credit Act, it's got to do with the granting of credit. Now, in terms of the granting of credit, every credit provider has to take into account what the stipulations are and how they do affordability assessment. When you go apply for a loan, when you go apply for a motor vehicle finance, or whatever it is in terms, in terms of credit, um, the credit writer doesn't just decide whether or not they like you, and they're just going to grant you the credit. It's become extremely strict and regulated since 2007 in terms of, in terms of the National Credit Act, and there's certain very important provisions that they have to abide by. If they, if they don't, there are very, very serious implications for the credit provider, which I'll also deal, also deal with shortly. And what I want to emphasize in terms of necessary expenses, that's one of the things that a credit provider has to look at 
in terms of whether or not they're going to be granting credit to a particular consumer. And in terms of necessary expenses, one of the factors a bank must always take into account is the maintenance obligation. They have to take that into consideration. It's so important they even mention as part of the definition. It's not just all living expenses, living expenses and including maintenance payments. Unfortunately, again, even though there's provision for it, when we do the assessment or when we evaluate whether a credit has granted that credit recklessly or not, many times we have found that it hasn't been disclosed by the consumer that is paying maintenance and it hasn't been asked by the credit provider, do you have maintenance obligations? Why is that significant? Well, it's significant because when a bank is granting credit and they receive someone's bank statement, and if there's, and if there's a, a wayward father who's not paying his maintenance, and as I said, it's not being listed on the credit report, so the, so the credit provider can't pick it up there, they're not going to see it in the bank statements either because he's not paying his maintenance each and every month, even though there's a court order in place. So that's why it's important that if it's listed in the credit bureaus, there's a duty and an obligation on the credit provider to do a reasonable assessment in terms of the information that they can have available. They can't just solely rely on the information that's given to them by the person applying for credit. Because as you know, if you apply for credit, suddenly your groceries are much less, suddenly your expenditures are much less because you want to qualify. That's normal human nature. The banks know that, and that's why they have certain, certain regulations in place to ensure that they don't extend reckless credit. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. This is also very significant in terms of the retention periods of, of uh, for credit bureau information. What this means is, how long does the credit bureau keep the information dealing with the person's credit profile? Now, in terms of civil judgment, that has to be listed on the credit bureau for a period of five years after judgment has been granted. For a period of five years. So even though the, the judgment is possible for 30 years, five years it must be listed, then it can come off. Doesn't mean the person's going to have access to credit again because that particular credit provider knows that there's a judgment in place, but ultimately it does come off the, the credit report. The whole idea is we try to rehabilitate people not to be held back in terms of being able to carry on with their lives. We want them to be credit worthy. So, in order for them to be credit worthy, the National Credit Act and the regulations are put into place certain provisions to try and help people to clean their credit records down the line. But what's significant about maintenance is it doesn't come off, even though in the, in the beginning where I said it has the same effect as a civil judgment, in terms of this regulation that we have on the screen and also in, in your uh, handouts, it's actually more powerful than a judgment. The judgment comes off after five years. A maintenance judgment doesn't. It stays there until it's rescinded and obviously until, or until the obligations are met and, and the, the maintenance is no longer necessary. So judgments in terms of maintenance orders stay longer than a civil judgment. But it doesn't help if the judgment is not listed in the first place. So it's supposed to be there, it's supposed to be there for up until it's rescinded, but if it's not there in the first place, well then, what's the help? Next slide. Also in terms of the regulations, when credit's being extended, part of the question, the questionnaire that gets put to consumers when they're applying for credit, Various sections, your income, your expenses, all of your petrol, your groceries, all of that. But 3.7 part of the regulation, so this is part of what must be put to the consumer when they're completing the application for, or when they ask the questions in terms of what the expenditure and the income is. And you can again see the emphasis. 3.7 maintenance expense got its own section. It doesn't fall under another category. It has its own section which emphasizes the importance of maintenance when it comes to granting of credit. And again, I'm going to have to reiterate this. It's fantastic, great, it's all there. It's all there, but if it's not being properly enforced, then we're back to where we started. Then what's the point of everything that we have? What is the point of having a beautiful constitution, having the National Credit Act, the Consumer Protection Act, if, the, if it's not being implemented on the level of everyone that's, that's conducting their lives, buying, buying, buying store credit, going, filling in petrol at a petrol station, we need to have the framework put in and implemented into practice. And everyone here can play a small part in terms of doing that. It has to start somewhere. It's pointless me standing here talking very loudly and very quickly to everyone. Um, and that, it's not a vendor that doesn't go any further than this room. 
So that's why I'm trying to impart some of some of my, my knowledge, and um, and everyone can take that further in your own way and try and get this, this whole space of maintenance into a, into a better field in terms of being able to have orders that are enforceable in a practical way. Next slide. I did mention uh, earlier the, uh, the assessment criteria that must be followed by, by credit providers. It, it's set out there, that's what the credit providers need to do. They need to, they need to determine their own mechanism of how to evaluate credit. But those mechanisms have to be within the constraints of the regulation. There are very particular uh, bullet points that they need, they need to follow. They can't just use their own criteria. It has to be fair, reasonable, and rational in terms of, in terms of the, the, uh, the assessment criteria that they use, which is, as I said, a fair and objective assessment. And it must not be inconsistent with the affordability assessment regulation. It's quite detailed in how a credit provider must look at the consumer's bank statement. How it must evaluate the determination of the persons that are being expensed. Like I said before, it's like, like house MD, everybody lies. <coughs> and when you apply for credit, certainly everybody lies there too. And the banks are aware of that, as I said earlier. So the bank has to take certain measures in place to ensure what's being presented to them is reasonable, and then obviously to change to whatever respect is reasonable in terms of their assessment procedure. One of the most powerful things that was introduced by the National Credit Act was the concept of reckless credit. Before 2007, there, there was nothing like this in place. The bank grants you the credit, and you, and you aren't able to pay it, they can enforce it, no matter how that, that credit was extended in the first place. There was a realization that the credit providers had to be reined in. You, the, the entire population was over indebted, there was too much credit being extended, and um, it had to be regulated. Uh, Self-regulation doesn't work in, in, in any part of, of any industry. So the concept of reckless credit was introduced, and as I said, as we can see shortly, and then it has very dire consequences for the credit provider. So in terms of in terms of reckless credit, there is a duty placed upon a credit provider to be able to, to that they have to ensure that the person that's applying for credit has a general understanding of the risks and obligations of what credit rooms are in, entering into. So they must know what they do. They must know what the implications are. What effect is it going to go, have on the household? Are they going to be able to buy groceries at the end of the month because the credit was extended? That is important. And that duty rests on the credit provider. And that's important to emphasize. The other thing that the bank has to do is they have to look at the debt repayment history of the consumer. In simple terms, what does it mean in practice? It's the credit report. The, the thing that started right from the beginning of, 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 of this. It's the credit report that must be looked at. It shows a detailed history of what's going on in that consumer's financial situation. Are they meeting their, their obligations or aren't they? If they're behind, how far are they behind? How many months they are behind? That all becomes relevant in terms of whether that person can afford new credit. Very simply, if you can't afford to pay the credit you really have, then the, you should not be being, being given access to more credit. And then also in terms, in terms of the evaluation process, you must also look at existing financial means, prospects and obligations of the consumer. Basically what it means is, in simple terms, can this person afford more credit or not? And it's not just an opinion of the credit provider, there must be a process in place. And they must be able to justify how they reach that decision. Now section 83 is one of my most favorite sections of the National Data. I, I guess I gotta sleep at night and dream about it. That's, that's how much I love Section 80. <laughs> and it's the credit card's worst nightmare. When I talk about that, I'm talking about I'm not just talking about small loan shops, I'm talking about the four big banks as well. They hate this section. And it's freaking amazing. What it says is the following. If a credit provider didn't follow those provisions I, I dealt with earlier, those three things, if that's not in place. Then any credit that they extended can either be set aside completely or, or in part. In other words, if you go take out a loan of 100,000 Rand, I'm not going to mention credit provider, I might, I might, be, I might be the same thing, from, from any credit provider. And it can be shown that it was reckless, that the person couldn't afford it. And the evaluation process didn't meet the criteria in terms of what is reasonable and objective and rational then that entire debt can be written off. In fact, we have case for it. It's happened, and it is happening. 
Or it can also happen that he does have to resolve the entirety. The court, hearing the matter, has discretion to say, you know what? You receive this money, you've spent it. Let's not write it again to tell you, but let's write it all the interest. So you're going to pay back that 100,000 Rand, but at no interest. You're giving an essentially interest-free loan because it was it was recklessly granted. Now that is that is massive. And that sounds it sounds great on paper, but it works in practice. If you have an attorney that knows the section, knows how the credit criteria works with regard to the bank, you can go to court and successfully get debt written off. You can have home loans written off, millions of rand, if the bank has been reckless. And trust me, many times they are. The other part of reckless credit is you can also suspend, suspend the payment of that debt. So in other words, you take out a loan and then the court can say, listen, we're not going to write anything off, but we're going to suspend your payment loan for two, three, four, five years, depending on what the circumstances are. Which is also a very effective manner of uh, persuading credit advice for granting uh, uh, credit records. Next slide. Now, as much as I love the previous section, this is a section I really hate to read. So this is the one I've got a, I've got a better time than I can read about. It's the complete defense which credit providers love to rely on. So if you go to court and you say the bank was reckless, shouldn't they give me this? I don't want to pay the money back. Then they go, uh uh, wait a minute, section 81.4. What's section 81.4, ladies? You have the handout, it's all there. <laughs> Section 81.4 essentially says, if the consumer lies, that's a complete defense. So if you go to the bank and you lie to them and say, I own so much, in, in, uh, uh, so much income and I, I have very little expenses, they can justify that and say, listen, you lied. Had we known that you lied, we would not have granted the credit in the first place. So that sounds bad, but it's not as bad as what it seems. Because at the end of the day, there's still an obligation for credit providers to do a proper assessment. And whatever the lie is, it must have been the documentation that before the, before, before the credit provider. Because if they have the information and they can see all of these things going off the bank statement, because when you apply for credit, you have to at least provide three months bank statement. You're self employed, six months bank statement. So even if you put your groceries down at 500 Rand and your family are five, I mean, obviously that's, the, that's not a truth. Um, but you can see the bank statement, whoa, this guy's going KFC, whatever. He's going, he's, he's going crazy. He's going to the sperm, which is not that cheap these days anymore, unfortunately. Um, clearly, you can see from the bank statement. Then, then that would not be a complete, that would not be a complete, complete defense because the credit provider has the information before it. And this is the problem we have. So right at the beginning, what did I say? Maintenance, order, credit bureau, enforceable. But if that maintenance order is not being listed at the credit bureau, how does the credit provider know that this person is paying maintenance or is supposed to pay maintenance and he hasn't paid for the last 12 months? They don't. We saw in the, in the expenses, um, 3.7, maintenance obligation. If that's not filled in or left blank or put north down, how does the credit provider know? They don't. And that's where the section kills us. Because if the consumer did in fact lie, that information is not readily accessible to the credit provider, then that would be a complete defense. So that's why we need to have a drive to make sure that main, defaulting maintenance orders are listed at the credit bureau. Because when the person does apply for credit, and that credit provider can see he's this guy spending a great income, and he's paying all of his, all his creditors, I mean, he's paying his car, he's paying his house, he's paying his loans, he's paying his credit card, but you know what? His bug is not paying his maintenance. What does that mean? Well, you're not meeting your, your existing obligations. I can't grant you. I can't grant you credit. And if they do, then it's reckless. And if they do that, then that that loan that was granted to them would then be reckless, and that could be written off. And that would be very significant. Why? Because when you go to court and you're asking for maintenance, you don't, you're not going to have the father, or maybe the mother, who knows, but mostly the father. Going to court to say, I can't pay more maintenance. I have all these credit things. I have this credit card. I have that clothing account. I have that loan. I have this car that I just bought two months ago. I don't have anything left. No disposable income. And on paper, that's true. But if you look at that, you say, listen, what is going on here? Why are you in this situation? Why do you have all of these other accounts but you're not paying your maintenance in terms, in terms of civil judgment? A maintenance and a civil judgment should be far more effective in terms of being complied with then a loan gets granted. It's a preference claim. 
but it's not happening. It's not listed the query bureau currently, and that's a problem. And it should be. We have the law in place. Or I'm completely wrong, which I'm not. Um, next one. Okay. I said earlier in the section that, that the, the record spreader section was my, was my favorite section of the app. But in doing doing the circuit of giving these giving these uh, these uh, presentations, I've come to really like section 83 and, and 85 as well, very much so. And I'm very excited about this. And you're going to see now why. I'm not going to read the sections up. You have it in your you have it in your hand up. But I'm going to explain to you what this means in practice. And this is what I want when you leave today to remember section 83 one and section 85 when you go back to school to return to the main principle. Section 83.1 deals with the fact that any court cons considering, a credit, considering a credit agreement may declare that credit agreement left reckless. Now that is very vague. It's not saying any court in terms of which a credit agreement is being enforced must consider whether or can consider whether or not it's reckless. In other words, if uh, AFSA goes to court and says you haven't paid your car, the court has the right to has a, got the right to say, wait a minute, is this reckless? And then and then um, make a determination of whether or not that that car was granted, that the vehicle finance was granted recklessly. But it doesn't say that. It can obviously happen then. It says any court in terms of which a credit agreement is being considered. Now my argument is a maintenance court considers credit agreements in terms of the evaluation process of the affordability of the father, the wayward maintenance payer, whoever it is, on the ability to pay maintenance. And not just the ability, but the ability of how much maintenance they can pay. So when the father comes into court and he's got all his accounts and his bank statements, you can see all the debit or is running off. What's the maintenance court doing? It's considering that credit agreement. So what you can tell the maintenance, the maintenance officer, what you can tell the magistrate is, this guy didn't have his car five months ago. Now suddenly he's a high luck bucky. How's this possible? And normally speaking, the match say, yeah, but now, you know, it's, it's, it's an expense. We've got to take into account. It's going to affect the maintenance. It's going to affect the ability of the person to pay and to the extent to which they can pay. No. Section 81 says, hey, wait a minute. You haven't been paying maintenance for nine, for nine months, but you've got this new vehicle that was financed three months ago. I think that's reckless. And they can make an order in terms of that being reckless. And we dealt with that earlier. In terms of the vehicle, you can have the agreement declared reckless. And in terms of the law, what happens when the vehicle gets declared reckless? The, the credit agreement gets cancelled, so the vehicle no longer gets paid, and the vehicle has to be returned back to the credit provider. So now when you go to court and he's paying 5,000 rand for whatever, in terms, in terms of the new vehicle, take out that 5,000 5, rand expense. Give it back to the credit provider. There's a hell of a lot more income now available for maintenance. And then in terms of section 85, almost the exact same wording. In terms of any court proceeding, any court proceeding in which a credit agreement is being considered, if the person comes to court and says, I can't pay my maintenance obligation, I can't, I can't afford it. Well, what he's basically saying is he's over indebted. He has too much debt. The magistrate's court, just like any other court, has got the right to tell to that person right there, sorry, sir, you're telling me you can't pay your maintenance. I've looked at, I've considered your credit agreement that you placed before me. I can see the debit order is running off your, off, your, off your bank statement. I think you're over indebted. And the maintenance court can make an order, ordering that person to go see a debt counselor to have his debt restructured. That's not happening. But it's there. Well, it was on the slide before. Section 85. What does that mean? What does that mean in practice? It means two things. First of all, if a person is placed under debt to you, they no longer have access to credit. They are barred from the access to credit while they are under debt to you. And the only way they're going to get out of debt to you is once they've settled all of the debt obligations. The maintenance is the preference payment that it will pay in full. All the other claims in terms of credit providers that have extended credit 
those accounts are going to be reduced. So not only does he no longer have access to credit, he can't make more debt, he's also got then the chance to have his debt restructured so he's going to pay less. So to give you an example, if his debt obligation, including the maintenance, is 10,000 rand per month, he can go to a debt counsellor, if the debt counsellor does the job really good, and they can, he can have a 10,000 rand reduced to something like 6,000 rand per month. And I'm not talking nonsense. I'm the one that goes to court and gets those orders granted. And those are the sorts of orders that we get granted in terms of restructuring of debt. That's 40%, 40% less. What does that mean? 40% more available for maintenance. Section 85, ladies and gentlemen. If you go to maintenance, maintenance court, take those sections with you. If you have your hand up, Page 45, 46, 47, one of those pages, that is the section you want to refer to. And you can tell the match put in Zimmerman's sector. Next slide. A summary. What this is all about is how everything interlocks with each other. It's great having all these powerful sections in the end. But it has to have practical, real life consequences. So, if you have a listing on the credit bureau, if you have the default payments listed, if the federalizer has access to this listing, it will affect the ability to grant credit. If the courts are referring to consumers to, in terms of regular credit, to have, to have the debt written off, cards being returned. If the court refers those over indebted people that can't pay their maintenance to debt counselors, and thereby reducing the debt obligation so they have the ability to pay the maintenance or even pay more maintenance if that, if that happens. But barring them having access to credit, they can't just make more debt and more debt while avoiding paying the maintenance obligation. That's a win win. And this is not a pipe dream. It's there. You have the sections in your handout. We just need to all, in our own way, start asking the court for your rights. Asking the court to enforce what they are allowed to do in terms of the act. You might not win the first time, but if enough people start going to court and say, listen here, I think these agreements are reckless. Listen here, he's clearly over debt, he says he can't pay attention. Let's have him go to a debt council. It's an order, he has to go. Otherwise, he's going to be in contempt of court. Enough people ask. It's enforceable. It's a civil judgment. I mean, and that happens, and, and I come here in a year's time. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to have nothing to say. Because everything's fucking fantastic. You want to get the good microphone here, that's why you can tell. The was here, you can have three different names that way. Mr. Quinton Zimmerman, details is page 49 of the um, uh, presentation. Page 21 to page 49, please. So you get, we've got a PowerPoint presentation there for you, as well as a narrative that you can read to it. Slowly, don't understand because I, I understand now, but <laughs> easy, it's light shining at the end of the tunnel. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Quinton Zimmerman. Uh, Mr. Um, um, Lloyd, right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, the good news is the, the, the Maintenance Act and the National Credit Act, um, they were amended way back in. Uh, 2015 already. We've uh, lobbied for that for at least eight years. That's the good news. Uh, it's been changed. It's now possible. The better news is uh, that was uh, was shared by uh, by Quentin the uh, There's no coincidence in life. Uh, he happens to be my neighbour. <laughs> um, I've got the, the best lawyer on. The National Credit Act living next door to me. Um, the best news is uh, we have a system that's available to accommodate. Okay? 
and that can be found um, on maintenance. Orders listed. You don't have to wait for um, the maintenance officer to do it on your behalf. Um, you can also list your arrears maintenance there. We've got the buy in of the CTB Credit Bureau and in collaboration with CTB. So that service is available. And that's the best thing. Annika has got so the website is
solve my future to be created. So please come this year, 2020, we will take our rights. And if we did service delivery, this is not up to standard, we will claim to service delivery at just the document for three days. If a magistrate is a rule to you, we go to the magistrate's commission and we file a complaint to it and they will have to deal with that magistrate. It's no use that you complain on social media where only the, the ladies will tell you, I said it's so sorry, then for me, yes, for them, it's okay. Tomorrow you're going to sit in the same court and have to face the same people. If we complain to national, to service delivery and justice, service delivery and justice on the job that we make, they will have to take that case We are not going to be able to sit in WhatsApp groups and say, sorry, sweetheart, but maybe we'll be the best of one day. That's why we've got cases on the court of 18 months to four years. It's because people are just complacent and sitting there and hoping for the best to happen. It's not going to happen unless you stand up for your rights. The community dialogues for this year is being created to give you your rights and show you the way. What you do to it is up to you. If you want to go back to the Facebook group and complain and lament over the internet, oh, it's so bad. If you want to do that, be my guest. But the community dialogue is going to empower you to give you that information that you need to make it better. The National Strategic Plan on Gender Based Violence and Femicide in Pillar 5, 5 to 4, say that we need to empower women. And one way that we can empower women is 5.4 in the maintenance court. Those empowering start here. If you want to be empowered, I think the next eleven installment of the maintenance dialogues that will be presented at this building. This building is going to become a building of excellent quality. Yeah. Use this information that we make available to you. If you want to be empowered, this is where you're going to be empowered. If you want to get information of what to do, what you must have, on policy law, on legislative uh, level, this is where you'll get that information. Please tell your colleagues and your friends out there that the what you heard over here that you've got news, and let's take this message further from here on this. Uh, if any of you want to get extra copies of this, please let us know. We will make that extra copies available. We'll Put it on the WhatsApp and we will email it to you in case you need it. The next meeting will be the 24th of February. Please be here that day. Saturday, 24th of February, will be our second installment of the uh, dialogue. Uh, there will be a little bit of a uh, 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 just sitting up Mr. Beatrice's um, uh, um, uh, PowerPoint quickly, but if you give us just two minutes, then we will be ready to start off with.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much uh, for my well spoken brother just prior to standing for me. I had a mess this morning, so uh, I really appreciate him very, very much. Um, it's such a beautiful day out there, and normally I come to life when it's raining, so I'm very grateful that we could be given this home space. Dialogue is probably one of the most important things in the entire world. Yet it's the most untapped resource among nations. When I look at our world today, I often ask the question, dialogue a modern invention? Is it something that is now being discovered by some academic and placed on the face of scrutiny, peer-reviewed articles, to try to lend credence to that amazing discovery? Or is it something that has always been there, but something that has been so changed by our world because our world has become an adversarial environment? And so what we do inadvertently, we leave a trail of broken people behind. And in the end of the day, we walk away as women. And then we say, I want, I got what I needed. But is there another way that one can get to where we as a country and as a nation need to be? The answer lies in a very strong push toward dialogue, toward talking with one another, not at one To be able to seek solutions together Solutions that are negotiated and agreed upon where everybody can buy into the solution. Throw their weight behind it rather than have it imposed on them. And then they say, well, that's just the way it is. You win, you lose. There must be a middle ground to all of this. At this time, I want to just mention to you a few things that has happened the last few weeks. I was blessed to visit my children in the States. They're studying over there and they are doing a great job there for six weeks. And during that time, and please forgive me if you're disappointed, but I'm not really an Elvis kind of cat. Elvis is a great singer. Oh, I love the way that he springs blue suede shoes and he coys his knee up. Wonderful, marvelous. And I think all of that has got its place. But there's a couple of things I'm going to share with you this morning that hopefully will help you see that the lessons that I've seen being going through that side of the world hopefully can be helpful for us to kind of leapfrog ahead. Our democracy is very young, and yet we find in our democracy we still got so many wounded people. I really prayed and hope if we can have the next slide. We ask the question: what is a dialogue? What is dialogue about? Dialogue helps us to appropriate the skills of when we are resolving conflict, we level the playing field. In other words, you and I consider such as equal. There is no master-servant relationship, and we start to talk about not you and me, but we talk about us. What is going to make it work for us? What is going to help us understand that here and now in this beautiful new country, we're going to have an entirely new way of thinking. Why is it that a racial agenda, and I'm going to ask the hard question, because this is about dialogue, remember? Why is this racial agenda constantly being flaunted around as an excuse for racial injustice and the policing of one segment of the, of the population so that the other part of the population can make demands and break and burn things up? I went through a country where the monuments are treated with respect. I went through a slave, a graveyard behind Walmart, Walmart paid for it, and I saw the only remnants of that funeral graveyard were bricks, marking the sites 
of slaves, unnamed, that died. And across the road from the, the Walmart was another graveyard, which is beautifully kept as well, but it's got wonderful, wonderful, beautiful uh, 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 edifices marking the graves of the story They've not changed. We did not break it down to erase our history because it is part of what makes that nation great. Arguably, it's got the greatest economy in the world. We find that China is trying to say it's similar to us and we are throwing our way behind the BRICS nation, but there's so much going on. Folk arrive in your office or in court with high levels of anxiety, feeling vulnerable, feeling that my rights have been infringed. Will I get the relief that I so desperately need? Will I be able to feed my children because my husband walked out on me? And like I worked with a couple there where the husband walked out and started to create an environment where he could operate with Peter Fitt. He's now in jail and quite rightly so. The key behind it is at what point will we as a nation look at our most vulnerable and say that we need to look at these things differently. We feel intimidated by the sheer unfamiliarity of surroundings and I love Quinton's comment as well as my brother Ray says his fiance comment. Where they say you familiarize yourself with the fine print of all these legislation so that when you walk into that courtroom you stand there informed you know what your rights are you know what can be compelled and so at the end of the day an informed nation is the most dangerous nation in the entire world yeah, yeah. a nation that can stand up for what it knows and what it believes in can say this is where you stop and where we start talking don't talk to me down to me you speak equals, equal participants in the beautiful democracy. I was offered a position as a lecturer at a university, two, three universities in America, one in New York, one in Evelyn Christian, and the other one over in, at, um, just met for about the moment. Not interested. I'll tell you why. This is my country. You see, when I look at our country at the moment and I ask the hard question, why is it that my dream at, when I was at, at UWC in 1982, when I was chased by cops and all I was doing was trying to seek an education, why is my dream turned into a nightmare? Something is horribly wrong. Martin Luther King made the comment and he said, evil flourishes when good men and women do nothing. To me, to rise up and say, what's going to some of it? You piece this country out of billions of rands. And still today, the rape of this country, the trodden on the dreams, is still continuing. We have voted for a non-racial country. What we have is just a reverse racism. I'm sorry to shock you. It's also unjust. And somewhere along the line, we need to ask the question, at what time do you and I become South African? Or is there a measure that will determine at what level my buying is? Yet you want my rent. You want what I have. You want to rape me because, because that's what you want. You don't want the relationship with me, but you want what I can do. That is unjust. Martin Luther King made a comment many years ago when he was speaking at the Freedom Rally. He said the following, that we have got one of the best constitutions in the entire United States, but when we took our check and we went to cash it at the government, it came back. You are overdrawn. Insufficient funds. And the reason I'm speaking about these things is because the sheer unfamiliarity of surroundings intimidates. Discomfort with the person in the room is accentuated. And here's where you and I, as a facilitator, fit in beautifully. I'm not, I really hope you can see this clip. Uh, sis, will we be able to hear the sound on it? If not, don't stress. Don't stress. We go to the next one. 
they'll always do that another time. Here's a clip that I wanted to play to you of Mr. Chair and a young man that confronted him about his absolute mishandling of the crime, not only in this country, but to the most vulnerable in our college, college community. What Mr. Chele then did was to typically refer to the idea that I fought for this country. I did this, I did that, I didn't eat food. And this poor young man said, I'm not going to let you get away with it, sir. You are neglecting the most vulnerable of our society. And then he went on to a tirade, threatening this young man. At what point does that young man get considered as an evil one in the society that can hold their leaders, leaders accountable? This problem of unfettered freedom on part of leaders must come to an end. Mr. Abraham Lincoln, the next slide, is one of the most amazing people. I've read a lot about him. He made a comment and he said, protecting our right to disagree is one of democracy's gifts and converting this inevitable tension into creative energy is part of democracy's genius. You and I sit around the table and start to look at things differently. And that is why I will forever be grateful to a man like Laurie, a man that I come to his beautiful wife, then I met Dion and his beautiful wife, Natalie, and by bad luck, I met Steve Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> by default, that came as part of the package. <laughs> and what I did see, and what I am seeing, is that you're like-minded people. Here's the key. We need to move out of silos of speciality and move to a platform of dialogue where we can talk and we can bring this and we can seek solutions together. I'm going to tell you a few things. I mean, you will come to that a little bit later. The reality is, my speciality is, that when I deal with couples in crisis, I deal with people both that have history of childhood pain and relationship work. No one walks into my office that walks in there and says, it's a great game, isn't it? Many of them walk in tall guys. And I need to be so sensitive I deal with different people. I, deal, I had such a good giggle. I had a wonderful couple. The one was Hindu and the other one was Muslim. And she said to me, I can't believe that I was referred to you. I think you referred the couple to me. And they arrived there and says, here we come to a Christian couple therapist. And I said, no, you've got it wrong. You've come to a human therapist. And as we started dealing with things, I watched both of them realize that so often we run into our silos. Yet we fail to understand that there's a, a wonderful playing field of creativity that lies next to us. And so often we want to use those kind of pre, uh, 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 want to say almost pre-recorded prejudices to, to push us away from one another, rather than draw us together and creatively to work out a solution, which we can. The key behind all of these things is that you need to, must, you, you will need to, the next slide if you would, this slide after that one, after that one, is the idea of walking across a bridge. When you and I step into a theological space, I need to be prepared to be humble. I need to be prepared to step over that bridge and meet you on the other side. Oh, you stay there. I'm coming to visit you. I'm coming to visit you and I'm coming to invest some time with you. I want to discover who you are. I want to know who you are. Somewhere along the line, I fell in love with you, and I'm talking in couples therapy terms, and somewhere along the line, I became amazed and curious about what you have for me. Or something that drew me to you, what is it? Not only on a conscious level, but on a subconscious level. And here's the risk. I think it is a lady by the name of Renee speaks about vulnerability. Vulnerability is something we don't like speaking about in dialogue. Because we don't want to be vulnerable, we want to be strong, we want to be powerful. But here's the key. The best solution is found when both become vulnerable to each other. And step into that space of respect and mutual regard. The next aspect for me, please, next slide. There was a man that passed away the next one says, um, yeah, the next one. Um, 
there was a man, I'm not quite sure if you remember, Doug Thomas Jolt. Doug Thomas Jolt was the United Nations, um, the next, yeah, the, he was the United Nations Secretary General and he died in 1961. It was said that when he died, on the plane crash, his best friend went to, to, to identify his body. And he arrived there and he found the Hamas Jolt's Bible. And he finds that he, the, the, the German translation of Iron Thou, that was written by Martin Buber, was lying in, in, in pieces with his blood on it. This was a man who was trying to seek peace for Namibia at that time. And this, the, the, the tests and all the investigations point out that he was assassinated by foreign governments. Because his effort to dialogically work out a solution was not favorable to those in power. And so they killed him. And so don't think that when you step into a logical, dialogical space, it's going to be a safe space. When you walk into that space to try to bring peace, you must understand that it is going to be a place of risk, but a place of great reward. Because inside of this, you will then be able to discover just how amazing it is when we treat each other rather than you or it, but I teach you as a thou. I am thou. It goes to many theorists who speaks of the idea of relationship. How do I view you? When I view you just as an it and I can make love to you and you don't have any part to play, I'm going to be very, you will some of the and all I do is I pay you after the session, you go, I don't want a relationship, but I want what you want, what you can give me. But when I step into that space of wanting a relationship with you, your definition changes to that. You become holy other. You become holy. And I'm going to go theological on you because in my Bible, it tells me that when you and I were created, we were created in the image of God. And I'm not quite sure if you quite grasp the concept of being created in the image of God. It contains all the necessary elements that would be there for you and I to tap into of creativity and to create an incredibly new world. That somehow we feel there's validation that I can stop the There's no room for that because, like they said, when the large elephants fight, the grass suffers. And so when we look at how this world is going, and I'm speaking to us, it works in maintenance and with the lives of people, that when you and I work and we see mom and daddy fighting, the children. And so we need to get that dialogical space down pat. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the greatest writers, he died uh, uh, at the news because he opposed Mr. Hitler and him and and, and the Hammerstadt were talking. I want to just read one of his quotes, it says, speaking about the idea and the necessity of dialogue. Bonhoeffer, in the solitude of imprisonment, wrote to a close friend, I often notice here, both in myself and in others, the difference between the need to be communicative, the wish for conversation, and the desire for confession. I want to stop up there. Sometimes confession is necessary. When I confess to you that I have done you wrong. What it does is it, in essence, restores the dignity of the person that has been hurt and says that I see you. I value you. I value your pain and I acknowledge that I was a contributor to your pain. And further to that, and I love Steve's comment, but you have no right to that. Why? Because I didn't get it. And so things change. It says the wish for a good conversation, a meeting of minds, is quite another matter. <laughs> but there are very few people here who can carry on a conversation that goes beyond their own personal concerns. And here's where I want to refer to a wonderful um, friend that I met in America, a man by the name of Fred Gray. Fred Gray is now 92 years old. And Fred Gray had been the attorney for the civil rights movement, NLACP. I spoke to him about those, those days, those difficult days, the bus boycott days, 
the syphilis investigation days. I spoke to him about Martin Luther King, one of the men that I admired and I was blessed with my wife to go to the Lorraine Hotel to see the place where he was assassinated. I'll speak to you a little bit about that later. I asked Fred Gray, what would be the solution for where we are at the moment? I want to point back to that Rosa Parks. Anybody knows Rosa Parks? Rosa Parks was one of the finest women in town. But did you know that the bus boycott did not start with Rosa Parks? The bus boycott actually started with Claudette, called Claudette Corbin, a 15-year-old girl that was pregnant at the time. She comes from a broken home, and because she wasn't a good representation of the cause, and I confronted Fred Gray on that, her story went quiet until the historian picked it up and gave it the right space so that the world can know is that she was the first. What they call them now is 82 years old. Beautiful young lady, who lives in the of the child. And the key behind all of this I want to tell you is that when we spoke to him, listen very carefully on how they structured it. And again, I love what Dion was saying, I love what Steve was saying, and I'm loving what we're talking about, is that he said, what we did, was to talk. We met and we spoke. We agreed and we disagreed. We divided up into specialities. He said, I drove the legislative arm. Martin Luther King was an excellent orator and he drove the narrative in terms of the public space. He said there were a few people who were the organizers on the ground that managed to see that everyone in the community were informed and they knew exactly what the stakes was going to be and what was going to happen. Inside of this discussion, he made the following comment. He says, whatever the problem is, find the problem. Solve, this, uh, solve the problem, but do something about it. Have a plan, in, in, uh, have a plan implement the plan. And if you lose, then the nation loses. No level playing field has come down. No, no unlevel playing field has come down without a careful engagement of the discussion. In his discussion, he says, most importantly, find like-minded people. People that can think. People that can articulate and formulate solutions so that it does not become a me, you, it becomes an us. It becomes a collective where people are saying, let's get where we need to be. Governor Wilder, and I'm just going to mention one uncomfortable comment that, was, that I asked him about. I said to him, how is it possible? How is it possible that in a nation that has got so much opportunity and is so wealthy, we still find poverty on the streets? He said to me, Derek, I can't answer that to you. And then I said to him, what's your greatest dream? And he said, my dream is to stay alive another 10 years. <laughs> I said, well, I suppose that's a very nice dream. But one of the things I want to speak to you about, the first governor, Governor Wilder, made a comment and he said the following, young people, I want them to know that oppression can be lifted. He said, reject the falsehood of drugs. Poverty needs to be dealt with and the ability can of poverty, uh, impoverishment can be overcome. The offer of a free society carries with it the requirement of hard work. Our society needs to work. And I'm shocking you on that. Our society has got too many perks where people make demands, unrealistic demands, where other people must pick up the tab and all they do is they burn and they stop and they and I'm talking about our people. The key behind it is when I ask him this hard question, he says, Derek, we battle even with this question today. To get human drive to actually say we want to rebuild and build with rather than break down. I sat with uh, Winnie Mandela many years ago. And in a discussion I had with her, and remember that time the Stompy Sepe story was really going wild. 
And I asked her, I didn't ask her about that, I said to her, you as a mother, what would you say to your children? And she said, what I'll tell the children of today, you need to stop sitting on your bums and expecting people to do your work for you. That means you don't sit around and make demands, but you get up, you find work to do, and you build. And you build in your community, you tidy up your community. Sadly, she passed away. Dialogue provides structure for disabled feelings. Dialogue, the next one, sorry, uh, and that, uh, uh, Dialogue provides structure for disabled feelings. It gives equal time and chance to express feelings. It also makes sure that it arrests and suspends flight or flight, the next one, fight or flight reactivity. In other words, don't run away. We need to talk. The fourth one is it enhances and it elicits good feeling hormones. In other words, the person starts feeling good because they are validated. The next one is a facilitator. You are experiencing the birth of a holy moment is the next one. The next one after that, it deepens relationships and educates culturally. It provides a platform that regulates power dynamics between people where I see people differently. I see you as my equal. The next slide I want to touch on is a comment made by Tom Anderson in his book called Reflecting Tea in Dialogues and Dialogues About Dialogues in New York, 1991. And he makes the comment and he said the following, that dialogical conversation in therapy and other contexts is distinguished by sheer inquiry. The coordinated action of continually responding to an interacting work of exchanging and discussing ideas, opinions, biases, memories, observations, feelings, emotions, and so forth. Shared inquiry is a process in which the participants are in a fluid mode characterized by an in there together, two way, give and take exchange. I've got a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist in Nova Scotia. He's, he consults with the American Psych Psychological Association in America and he's just gone in retirement, but he's only kept a few clients with him, as well as still does his work in Europe, as well as in America. And one of the comments he said, there was a massive shift, even within psychology, that they are moving into this idea of positive inquiry. In other words, what are you, 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 you doing that works? Make sense? Let's see at what works. What changes the human psyche from a pretty much a negative environment to something that is positive? Let's talk together. And when we started to talk about it over the phone the other day, it was just amazing to hear the kind of work that has been done. There are various kinds of dialogues. The one is an informal chat with you and, and a friend of yours over a cup of coffee. The next slide, sorry, um, Matthew, um, is, uh, yeah, the next, just, yeah, there we go. The next the important is between two, two colleagues talking. The other one is a facilitated dialogue, dialogue where you ask someone to sit in and to help you. For example, we would have a man like Laurie or, or his wife Annika sit with two people, not taking sides but facilitating the right of dealing with their problems and helping them to resolve this matter. There's then also in Imago called the social dialogue, where people talk into a community and where people will talk with one another and there's a reflective back and forth within that dialogical process. And then there's a one-on-one -on -one dialogue where you sit with your loved one as a couple and want to talk about things. Again, speaking and listening. Listening and speaking. And that kind of back and forth is creative. It means in terms of dialogue that it emphasizes the involvement of two or three people when we are talking about it that's been borrowed from various languages like the Greek, Greek, as well as from Latin. In fact, also part of this language has gone into Spanish and I was looking up this morning into French as well. Let's leave it there. The next one. Dialogue helps us to see the whole among the parts. Because what it does is rather than as silos, we, we raise these complex tubes of complexity. 
we then devolve them down where everyone else understands how this fits together. Where my contribution can fit into that. And that's what Fred told me. I said to him, Fred, what about some of the things that happened in the organization? And there were people that I was curious about, that I'd read about, that I knew Mr. Abernathy, that I knew was quite a, a difficult cat within their meetings. And he says to me, Derek, I focused only on legal matters. How to change the law. I focused on that. When we dealt with the bus boycott, I did not sit alone. I sat with other attorneys. I sat with other social engineers and we worked together. And here's the key. Not only what is wrong with the system, but how it can be done righteously. I visited with him at his offices in Tuskegee. He's an elder in a church. And he said to me, there are a few things that guide my thinking. God, my holy book, and my holy task in society. And that, he said, has kept me sane, and that has kept me on point all my life. Others can worry about the other issues. The next one after that, she speaks about seeing the connections between the parts, inquiring into assumptions, learning through inquiry and disclosure, creating shared meaning among many. In other words, when you speak as a maintenance officer, I get to understand what happens in your office. When I speak to a magistrate during a determination that he has to make, when the evidence laid before him, and I listen to him, I get to understand the dilemmas that he has. When I listen to Steve, Steve says, no, there are other things that must be put on the table. There are other things that has to be considered so that we can come to a right solution. The dialogical process means that we are stepping over a bridge. We walk over a bridge into an unknown. On the left side of your screen, you will see that, sorry, the next slide, I forgot to come. The next, you will see that there is a markedly, markedly different um, uh, of, of reality within those two bridges. The one is this beautiful triple, uh, double story house, and on the other side is a smaller home. Beautiful trees on the left and on the right, it's a different scene. But nonetheless, the same way you and I walk into each other's lives and you start to connect. Not as rich versus poor hands giving a hand out, or as a poor versus the rich, supposed rich, making demands, but we speak to each other as how can we add value to each other's lives. I'm going to give you a picture. Um, uh, skip that one, skip that one. Yeah. There's a great man that I love, Kian Stalkberg. I'm not quite sure if you know him. He's a rugby, he was a rugby captain many years ago. He's a large man, a tall man, but he's got a heart that's as big as this room. And this statue is in his office. He also does couples therapy. And he said dialogue means sharing two different worlds. If you can just uh, click on that so it can turn. If you watch how this turns, and you start to see that behind this imposing hand, is a little girl gently being protected by this hand that has the power to crush her, but doesn't. The hand that protects, the hand that loves. In the same way, in a married couple's life and in a relationship where you are in a committed relationship, if the one is stronger, that hand must never be used to crush. That hand must always be used to find a safe place and a safe place. Dialogue is about sharing two different worlds. I love seeing a different world. I was in the home of a Puerto Rican couple and had dinner with them one night. And he said to me, why are you coming to my home? Because there is. There are rich people in the environment I work, and they are poor. And I said, I want to get to know you. And we spoke with his family for hours and just connected. The key behind it all is, is that we need to learn to step into each other's lives. And be humble enough to say, 
there is something that you need to teach me that I need to understand. I'm going to move on. Uh, how much time have I got left? I think I'm probably almost done. Okay. There's, if you can move to the next slide. When we deal primarily with couples, that is the next one after that. That, that, that one. When we talk about couples dialogue in my context, and we also talk about it in mediation, is we create a safe space for both parties. We speak to people and we bring sanity to that home or that environment of this child. And we start to talk about things that are difficult to talk to and talk about. We start to talk about those things of where they speak about, yes, but you. And we start to change it. Yes, but what can I do to change? We start to talk about the idea that there, there is a great price to be paid. Because the price to be paid is the children are going to be paying that currency. Did you know at the moment in America, every single child born into that country is born with about an $80,000 80, price tag of debt. Trillions of dollars are being owed. Now, you might say, well, Derek, they could probably wipe it out within five years, but why don't they? Children are born into debt. Is that the kind of society that we want? Is that the society that we want that forever will be the slave to the ram? Is it that kind of society you want to bring where children cannot go to university? Children can't go to study. Structured dialogue, the next one after that, again, gives place for expressions of emotions. Equal time and chance to express feelings. Next one. And again, it is done within a system of rules. The next one is it arrests and suspends fight or flight. It enhances and elicits good hormones. And again, the facilitator educates and he works for that only moment and he regulates power. In dialogue, people start to heal the moment they start to know that they are hurt. I'm going to move right on. I'm going to try to maybe go to three aspects of the process, which is further down. Further down? Yeah, three main aspects. When you and I start to work with people, understand that the first thing you need to learn is how to mirror. And that means that when someone says something to you, you can then say, let me see if I've got what you said. So you are saying, did I hear correctly? And if the person said, yes, you've heard me correctly, ask them, is there more you want to tell me about that? Tell me more. And allow the person the latitude to speak. Mr. Chele and the young man from Action Act of South Africa, Mr. Trick. Hear what I'm saying, and you can try to pick sides, and I suggest you don't. We as peacemakers will turn into that space and say, let's help. There must be another way that you can find each other. Where even this young man who had not lived through apartheid, did not experience the pain that Mr. Chele had. But this young man has inherited a, a broken system that he's trying to fix. And surely somewhere we can find each other. And that is about positive inquiry. Is there more? Validation is, yes sir, it makes sense to me what you went through and all of that that you went through is unjust and i can see where you are coming from mr chair and the other guy would be mr chair would turn around and say thank you for your concern for the community of kailisha thank you can we put arms together to find a solution jointly and then empathy i can imagine that you must be feeling totally and utterly robbed of an opportunity and of a South Africa that you live for and want to see improve. 
Is that how you see it? What I'm saying to us is that we have an amazing system of communication. We've got Facebook, Twitter, and we've got a few others in America which I never knew even existed. It has helped us to be in contact with one another, but it has driven us apart, and we've lost the skill to communicate with each other. And the question is, maybe we should take a step back and work in that separate space and say, let us do this together. It brings common solutions. It brings joint solutions that are constructed from various perspectives which is crucial to get the right solution. I'm going to just move on to probably the last slide because I want to honor the time frames that are given. There's a slide with Shalom on it. It's further on. There we go. Shalom is a wonderful word in Hebrew. When I was at UWC, I studied Hebrew probably under one of the best scholars, Dr. Pete Smith, Professor Pete Smith. He was the worst uh, disciplinarian I've ever come across in my life. And he loved Hebrew. Afrikaans gentleman that lived out in Belgium and passed away a few years ago. But he was hard. He was unmitigating in understanding that you need to stay. And you need to know. Shalom is an amazing construct. And the Hebrew will tell you that the word shin on the left hand side, as you got this um, anagram, it says shin, it means by teeth, consume, destroy. Lamet is the shepherd's staff, which means the leader, and it means authority. Also in Egyptology, it means the Uriah's crook. Then you have Va. Uh, uh, Yava, which is the nail, the hook, the security, the connected, and main, which is choose to construct out of destruction. It also means waters and floods. It means chaos. It means disorder. Now, why am I using that word within this context? I'm not quite sure if you're familiar with the story of Joseph that has been sold into Egypt. And by the way, you can verify the historicity of it. In, in, in papyri and in fact in Egypt, uh, Egyptology documents. But what you find was a young man was thrown from Israel, uh, uh, a Goshen, he was put into that area and he started to rule over Egypt. And this man, young man in about eight, Genesis 50, his brothers come to him after knowing what they did was they got rid of him and told their father that he was dead. He then became the deliverer. But what they did to him was wrong. What they did to him was criminal. And so they stood before him when he said, I am your brother. In other words, I now have the power. I now have the right of the life and death. And Joseph quickly said to them, am I God to judge you? And then he speaks to them and he says, what you meant for evil for me, God meant for good, so that I today can provide what we have in this beautiful Egypt to live in. Let me say this to you. I am no fool, and I'm saying that what we did in the past in this country was not good. It hurt a lot of people. But my question is, at what point do we reach this point of shalom, where we say, I am not God. Let's sit together. And let's work this out. What happened in the past was evil, and we all acknowledge that. You'll be a fool not to acknowledge it. But you'll be even a greater fool if you will take to revenge and trampling on people and doing exactly what was done to you. Lack of forgiveness in this country and insight and creativity astounds me. Especially by people who should know better. Mark Professor in the book. Writing about Mr. Mbeki speaks about the dream bird. There's another man that speaks about the book called The Endgame as a serpent day, where he outlines the, the dialogical process to get this country to where it needs to be. Mr. Ruth Mayer makes an acknowledgement on television where he says they should have stayed 
around longer to help the leadership of this country. But the reality is here with you and I, we inherit it. The next slide, and then I'm going to uh, close my talk. We inherited it, and this is the key. Even though we've inherited something that is tough, we can make a change and we can make a difference. On here, you would see on the left hand side, Mr. Craig Gray, 92 years old, with my son in law and myself. And we had a long discussion, and I'm so grateful that we could talk. He has got the presidential award of peace last year, July, from Mr. Biden. And watching his work and his hard work, he was one of the first attorneys to have a practice in Tuskegee. He also dealt with very, very complex legal uh, things, which I'm sure you'd be fascinated to read about. My daughter and myself were standing in front of the Rain Hotel when Martin Luther King was. On the left hand side, I'm not quite sure how good you are in terms of your music. Who knows Rick Hall, one of the greatest from, uh, producers of music? Who knows Aretha Franklin? Come on. <laughs> oh, can I just quick question? Don't tell her off, but who's uh, given your, your loved one a kiss on what Aretha Franklin is singing? Come on. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Recall very little known about this man. Sue and I and my wife, we were sitting uh, having coffee at home, and there was a documentary on Netflix at the time called Muscle Shoals. And in Muscle Shoals, there was a, a, a talk about Recall. Now, this man during the 1960s, it was the height of the Ku Klux Klan and the, 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 the clashes between black and white, and he was a musician. I'm busy reading his biography, and inside his biography, he tells how difficult it was and how traumatizing it was. His mom turned to prostitution and all the rest of it. And we eventually met his wife and had a long discussion with her. And during this time of his trauma, he was a very lonely man. But there was one thing that he did well, and that was produce music. And he brought together all the black musicians that came, the carpenters. Who knows the carpenters? Oh, come on, that's still legendary music today. All that amazing music that they brought, he produced them. He produced all the, I think it was Urda Kitt also staying in the studio, which he constructed, and he's changed nothing about the music. And on the bottom you would see, recall tales, tears down racial barriers. And you know what they used during that time? Was to use music and culture. That people could sing together. That we could mine out the beauty of creativity within our communities. Come on. I love Benda. I was spending about two, three weeks in Benda with a good, a week in Benda with a friend of mine at his home in PPD. I do not live in hotels there. I live in his home in PPD, a little township outside. And we were talking, and there was so much richness while we were chatting about life and about society and about our hopes and dreams. This man was a petrol attendant many years ago. Today, he's in the NEC's office as one of the great doctors that heads some of our biggest medical training facilities mm -hmm. in Cape Town. Wow. Sure. I have you know. So what I want to tell you is that there are people around us that knows what it feels like being down there. In his home, he has a little radio made of wire. And I said to him, what's the significance of this radio? He said, that radio I was listening to during my midnight shift. And that radio will always go with me to remind me from where I come that I will never forget where I come from and I will never forget those who are still there. And also ask the question, how are we going to get them to be far beyond and more than they are? Sometimes we forget where we come from. And like Winnie Mandela said to me that day, she said, some of us, we go on to that lift and we keep it there. We don't send it down to get others to come up to. I'll never forget that woman. I'll never forget at that time she said to me, I know that there is a fall over my head about killing Stompy Sefei. She said, I did not do it. I did not do it. Eventually, later on, I spoke to an intelligence officer of the security branch and they constructed a narrative 
which destroyed the, the reputation. What I'm saying to you is we need to ask those hard questions. Those hard questions that are going to cause us to think and to shift. But the first thing we must do is shift toward one another. The last one. This table on the right hand side bottom, I got a bit annoyed with it, but then eventually I understood. They said in Memphis the poor have been shut out of our minds and driven from our societies because we've allowed them to become invisible. And sometimes that's what Martin Luther King said, and that lady was protesting right outside of that Lorraine Hotel. Twenty-seven million dollars were being given to reconstruct and to improve that particular museum. And she said, what about the poor? As I drove down further to the bottom of that road, I saw the stark contrast between the opulence of Upper Memphis, beautifully constructed restaurants. And then we walked down and we saw the boarded up homes and broken down homes with people who are poor used to live. The next slide I want to close on where he says, we have to do something else. But here's the key. Throwing money at things, that's too easy. It's too easy. We've watched what throwing money at things and at problems in this country does. We've got to learn. There's a book that our wife showed me many years ago, and I'm going to leave it there. Many years ago, she was in a reading club which read a book called The Color of Water. It was a young Jewish who came out of Poland and married a black Baptist preacher in the Bronx. She married three times. All three of them were black preachers. She was a beautiful, tall, white woman in the middle of the Bronx, but you don't dare mess with her. Out of her marriage, she raised, I think it was eight or nine children. All of those children are educated today. Many of them are professors at universities, and one of them is a musician who wrote a book on the mark. I want to tell you the last part of that story. When those children were young, they were asked the question, Mommy, you are white and Mommy, Daddy is black. What color is God? And the title of the book says, God is the color of water. Remember Jesus made the same thing. He said, in John chapter 4, he said, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The spiritual components of ours is one of goodness, kindness, of love and affection, giving each other space to breathe and to grow. And so the question on the table is today, are we going to work toward that this year? Intention, wherever we may be, in the most complex of arenas to the most simplest of arenas. I love the fact that Stephen said, you tell him, Steve Zimmer had said so. I think that would be nice. And I'll tell you why. Because if a man's prepared to risk his name, the man believes in what he believes. Because then you can't touch them with a man like that. And so today I want to thank you for the opportunity I have to serve, to encourage you, to walk with you, so that this year will be an amazing year. A year of growth, a year of expansion, and a year of really deepening relationships. Wherever we go, so that we leave less of a mess when we leave this country. Thank you.
we just want to make sure that there's not a, a lot of people standing in the queue and then having to wait for a long period of time. So if you can just place your order now, then it will uh, help you to get out quicker once uh, you would like to get your wheel a little bit later on. So five, uh, 10 minutes, and after 10 minutes we will...
Somebody forgot their cell phone. Their cell phone is a female toilet. Somebody left or forgot their cell phone. Uh, somebody forgot their cell phone, please do not leave without your cell phone. Cell phone, anyone with your cell phone? Are you sure it's not yours? Yeah, I'm just kidding. Not yet, so let's see. Okay, um, but thank you so much for your honesty. Uh, the lady over there found it uh, uh, in the... Uh, in yours. In yours. Okay, well, what picture is on it? What's your profile picture? Oh, I found it on my soul. Thank you very much. That lady over there found it as well. Which one? She found it. Thank you so much for your honesty. Could have, could have sold it at Cat Crusaders at that piece of our time. You okay, people? Mr. Derek Baker said something pivotal. Seek like minded people and then pursue justice in that way. What we will be doing over the next year, over the next 11 months, starting the 21st of February, we're going to seek like minded people. And those like-minded people are the people that will be standing over here and telling how we can change the maintenance system and how we can bring about change. There is uh, one like-minded person um, that joined us in 2021 when we started off with the need of the maintenance dialogue. And that person is Mr. Eugene Orman. And ever since uh, 2021, it's almost two years now, we have had this success in our maintenance dialogue and the work that we have done. And um, uh, Mr. Uh, Eugene Opperman joined us in March in 2021. And ever since then, he had success as getting all these people together. Because social media is not one of my favorites. I have absolutely no idea what to do. My wife knows much more than me. And she is uh, uh, the one that uh, teaches me, but it goes in one ear and out of the other ear. Uh, I think I listen more to the dog than to what you have to So I need to get that right. Uh, um, like my colleague Quinton, uh, he's getting nightmares at night, so I'm trying to get better at it. Uh, but Mr. Eugene Opperman uh, went to Spain and he did the 300-400 kilometer walk and then he did something special. He went to India to go and look what is happening in India and how are they dealing with the system of gender-based violence, domestic violence and maintenance. So I asked uh, Mr. Opperman to give us this international perspective of what is happening in India and is there something of the Indian experience that we can make our own. So, over to my friends and brother and colleague, Mr. Eugene Oberman. As I said, there's some thoughts of this uh, that we will have later this year that was published in the uh, that we will also showcase, and there's a lot of other things that he's involved in. At the end of the Indian experience, we will hear a little bit more of what he's busy with and what will be happening on the 1st of February. Uh, but I will give all of that over to you for my I get to be up here and just chat. Thank you, guys. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, I'm used to screaming at court. Maintenance officers, magistrates, all of those. Yes. First of all, I would like to greet you. And I would say namaste, meradors. Meradors, to be there. Or rather, change to English because most of you, I gather, do not understand English. Unless there's someone that can translate. 
that was simply a greeting. Uh, my dear friend Derek said he spoke about Shalom, um, which is also greetings in Hebrew. Yes. Um, in, in Hindi, they would say Namaste. Namaste would mean I greet the God in you. I respect and I value the God in you. And that is by greeting an, another person. That was just something to start with. Yes, I was in India. And it was just not only for, for her day, but it was also combined as, as a working trip to find out how do they do things? And how is it different? What can we as South Africans learn from them? And it was quite, quite interesting. Um, yeah, we can just start off by the slides with the slides. Um, the, probably the third or the fourth day, I heard that there was a big commotion. Now, typically Indian, it is an overwhelming experience with smells and people because you, you I mean, there's in the, in the streets there are cows. So you, you, you have to mind the cow shit, the dog shit, the people shit. And it's just, it's cars, and it is tuk-tuks, and it is camels, and it's, you know what, and it's monkeys. Um, and I'm not talking about vegan people, um, because those, those, it's just detective. And I realized that outside my hotel was, was, a, was a tent being erected. And there was a lot of people gathering around, and uh, you know, typically I'm very curious. And I want to know, I want to know what's going on. So I went outside and I started speaking to the people. What was this all about? So they said it was part of the 16-day activism and the 16-day celebration. And they also linked that with, with two things. Uh, they linked it with the government elections and they also linked it with a community outreach and a seed the religion that they had uh, there, one of the uh, celebrations. So the, I found these people sitting in a tent. Um, can you just go to the next slide, please? Um, and you would notice there was a lot of people. I mean, it's not an auditorium like this. It's not like this. I don't have seats, no seating, no tables, no projectors, nothing. But to have people sitting on the ground listening, listening to someone standing in front and educating them, teaching them, listening to what he has to say, because that is important. Strangely enough, if you look at the photo, you would also see that the men and the women are split. And that's very divided in India because they still have the caste system. In our terms, we would call it racism, but it simply works for them because they've got certain caste, certain distinctive sections. So if you were born in a lower caste, you would be uh, prone to a certain job. If you've got a higher caste, you've got a better job. So these people were all split. Strangely enough, if you go to the, to the airport and you need to go through the security clearance where they search you, the females has a separate entrance, the males also has a separate entrance. So this being my 21st trip to India, um, I've been there for a lot. So if I talk about India, I get very passionate because that's my people. It's, it's my people. It's a poor country. I'm yet to see a Indian that is sad. Despite their poverty, their absolute detrimental poverty, they are, enthusiastic. they are good people. They will not ask you, what is your name? They would ask you, what is your good name? Implying your name is good. What is your good name? They would not ask you, where do you come from? They would ask you, which country do you belong to? I get goosebumps just thinking of that. How special is that? Which country do you belong to? So they have a sense of unity. They have a sense of Trusting the own, which we might not have in South Africa. Broken by like Absolutely. So, on this slide, please. So, I met up on one of these days, and the, the, the picture on the left is, is actually the picture taken from the balcony from my hotel restaurant. And there you can actually see the magnitude of the people. That was just a small screenshot. That goes on for kilometers on end. So I met up with a group, and I was, uh, how it came to that is while seeing this tent of people, they had this absolutely amazing three ladies sitting on a type of a stage. They had these sorry dresses on, beautiful, 
vibrant colors. One more shocking thing, but I'll highlight the pink. Highlight the yellow and highlight the well, can't remember other colors. I think blue or something like that. So they were they stood out like moths. And I wanted to take a picture. And be me being polite, not not a skillful craft, but I asked him, could I take a picture? And we started typically me with my big mouth, we started with a conversation. And they were there as representatives of a group called Action Aid India. That is a company that has been formed in 1972. So it goes back years back. So we started, so I, for me as a male, talking to a female in India, it's also a no-no, but me being a Westerner, they call it a Bora, um, I started speaking to them. And they, and, and we engaged in conversation, and it was, it was absolutely brilliant. And they invited me to their office the very next day. And um, we had to postpone that because the director flying in from Mumbai was in Delhi that time. From Mumbai flew in because he also wanted to meet with me because he realized upon the conversation that I was involved with women's rights, maintenance, domestic violence in South Africa, and also that I was an attorney. So I met up with them the very next day or the day thereafter. Um, the ladies actually went to my, hotel, to, to my hotel and gave them the details because I, I couldn't understand them. I've got limited knowledge of Hindi. I can speak conversational Hindi, but when, once they use the big words and they talk very fast, then, then I'm lost like in translation. I've got that zero out of ten blank South African state. So I met up with them and it was made quite easy. Um, and they are, they have, they've been going for 50 years. And I was quite amazed. They didn't have a nice big office. It wasn't that big. It wasn't that decent. But at least it was cheap. But it was great. Um, they, what they do is just a couple of the um, visions that they do. They promote children's rights, uh, creating a safe and dignified environment, legal counseling. Um, they very much into the agriculture. I'll speak to you about that. So on the left hand side of the slide, you'll see there's a couple of things that they do. Um, and they help an estimate for more than 6 million people, the most poorest and the most vulnerable of the Indian people per year. 6 million people. Then I ask the question, how many people do we reach? Today, how many people do we reach? It's sad. 66 people did not pitch for this workshop before this seminar. Isn't that sad? That's sad. They reached 6 million people. Highlights of their project there on the next slide, please. On the next, some of the highlights of their project is the promotion of children's rights to education, nutrition, protection, and overall well being. That's all said and good, good and well. But how do they do that? They are very much into building shelters, creating safe spaces, creating a, a safe space where someone that has been hurt, either by death, domestic violence, or financial economic abuse, physical abuse, uh, ego, all those types of abuses where they can take and remove that people. Because the females in India is much more marginalized than in South Africa. And it's still a system of patriarchy. Sadly so, sadly so, but the women's rights movements are moving in the right direction. One of the most stunning stuff that I've learned there is the promotion of land rights, the right to livelihoods specifically for single and vulnerable women. So what does that mean? And I had a long conversation with them and it was absolutely fantastic. They had research together with a Belgian uh, university that they did in India. And it was all about land rights. They've also had a very similar system that we have with the RDP office. When I get to put on the list, you get a free house. Everybody knows about that, right? They've got a system where if there is a government house that you get, it needs to be registered in both the husband and the wife's name. Why? Simple. Because it gives value to the woman. It gives value to the woman. They realize with research that domestic violence reduces by 30%. 30% reduction of domestic violence cases. 
the number of parental alienation problems, the number of physical abuse, economic abuse, because the female has a right to property. Why can that not be done in South Africa? Why can that not be done? You get the damn house for free. Why could the government not insist if you are married to have it in both your names, husband and wife? That would give her a sense of accomplishment, a sense of value, a sense of being heard, so that she cannot be left out if the ship hits the fan in terms of domestic violence and or maintenance or whatever, or even in the case of divorce. Maybe that is a proposal that we could lobby to um, the government with the power that we, without burning anything like parliament and building. They're also very much into promotion of sustainable forms of agriculture. They've got fast lands, uh, pieces of, of, of property that's available. Uh, India is a vast country. You probably fly about six hours from the north to the south just to, to bring you a little bit of perspective. Well, considering that a third of the world's population lives in India, that makes sense. So they have a lot of agricultural land available. And they have these projects where the females go out and they claim, <coughs> very similar to South Africa system, they just claim a piece of land, but they use it to their advantage. They go to the farmers and they ask them for a packet of seeds, a packet of millies, a packet of pumpkin, or whatever, and then they go and plant that. And soon enough, the community gets involved. They bring water, they bring fertilizer, everything. I've spoken to some of the groups, it took them two days organized to take a piece of land and in two days time the women went out and they and they got all the seeds from the farmers just a little bit not a packet not huge bag not from agricar from wherever not bags of seeds small packet and by, by a collective effort right, they could plant a massive piece of field you know what those are women of sudden power in the next three months the first child one of the children of them will get fed for the crops that they grow. It took them two days to do that. Two days. They also have a, uh, some of the highlights of the other highlights of their projects are the providing of legal counseling and aid to women survivors of, of, of violence. That goes also to show, um, speaks to the shelters that they do, have, but they do a lot of upliftment work work where they go out to the community and they go and talk to the community. Not in auditoriums. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. They sit on the ground. They don't need tables. They don't need chairs. They have been solicited. They engage with the community. Next slide, please. Some of the projects in the box are community. This was a lot of women that Say, you know what? We can in, in, in straits. We're in dire financial straits. We have to do something. And they went out to the local farmers and they said, you know what? We are collecting spice. So you've got your curry leaves and you've got your chilies and you get all those types of spices. They collect in small quantity. And they started a grinding plant for grinding masala. And now they're selling that in order to to establish a foundation of financial security for themselves. That has been set up probably in less than a week. We struggled in a month's time to get the other 66 people that did not attend to come in. On the bottom one, that's just another project in Gujarat, uh, where the women from the tribal communities, um, they, they call it a kitchen garden with their produce, um, which was quite beautiful. Um, I actually met one of those ladies. Um, stunning, stunning, stunning ladies. On the next slide, next slide, please. This was a great initiative which I think we should do in South Africa, all over India. Uh, the top portion of uh, the slide was actually done in Kashmir, where they had these big boards. But it, wasn't, it wasn't a board, it was like a, like a vinyl print that they put up all over. And on every street corner you would, you would have that stop domestic violence. This was part of this 15 day program. And anyone with a Koki or a pen could add their name on that. 
write it down because they support the campaign um, pledging to ensure that they would end domestic violence. And the intention afterwards was to, to stitch all these things together and make a huge flag and it over the gap for all these decisions. That's good. Why can't we do that in South Africa? Why can't we do it in every court? In every business morning, every evening. You went at the NBA, or you guys did it, but something similar. Um, at the bottom portion, up that's just legal training programs um, that they've done. Yes. Next slide, please. So, the bottom line that I've established in India was that, you know what, South Africa is not alone. South Africa is not unique. We are not so unique as we think that we were or are. We're not unique. We've got the same problems than any other country. We absolutely, like Winston also said, we've got world-class legislation. Our Maintenance Act, our Domestic Violence Act, our Children's Act are one of the top, top, top pieces of legislation ever that I've seen. I've sat on a couple of panels in Scotland and UK. I'm involved in uh, Australia and New Zealand as well. And I, and I, and I scrutinize their documents. We do have one of the best pieces of legislation all over compared to other countries. The problem comes in with the implementation. Our implementation thereof and the standing of the act are so busily lack that it is actually working to the disadvantage of the people actually wanting to go to court to have that enforced. In India, they've got a system where they, where they do not only publish, like our government gazettes, the new legislation, they actually go out. The NGOs go out and they give them pamphlets in their own language so that they know what is the changes to expect. Their public participation in the governance process is phenomenal. They engage with the community so much. That is lacking in South Africa. That is absolutely lacking in South Africa. They also have a system of accountability and political will. Um, in India, it's quite strange. You know what? If you do not do your job, you're out. Simple as that. And that speaks to the ministers being appointed, uh, even the president. Um, if you do not do your job, you're out. In South Africa, we don't have We don't have that. We do not have that sense of accountability. There's no recourse. You go to maintenance court, you sit with the, with, with the presiding officer, they do not give you the judgment that you wanted. Bearing in mind, now you get angry with the courts. You know what? It's probably not the court's fault. It's probably the process leading up yeah. to the judgment. Because remember now, the presiding officer was never there when you filed your J101 application right in the beginning. So he does not know you. You are from a bar of soap. He does not know who you are. He does not know you understand your circumstances. So he can only act upon what is being told, presented to him. But yet we get angry with the courts, which is actually wrong. Because the court, the presiding officer, is only doing it, only judging on what is presented. So there should be a form of, of accountability there as well. What I also saw was that the their court system it's a little bit different than ours. They've got regional, uh, district, county courts, so it works a little bit, a little bit different. And that leads to my next point on the it is court. You would not understand. There's two things that the Indians are good at, and advocate raising is time <laughs> management or lack thereof. <laughs> um, the Indians, you know what? If they sit, if they tell you, wait one minute, I can guarantee you, I'll put my year's salary on the block. You will wait for at least an hour. That's the one thing. Time management for the Indians, they've got, they've got enough time. The second thing is forms. These are those people have forms. <laughs> You'll fill in a form to get a form to fill in the dance. <laughs> <laughs> so they love the forms. That, that starts off once you step off the plane at death, then you get you a form. And that form you need to give to a person, and that gives you another form once you hand in that form. And then you get another one. And you need to fill in probably eight or nine forms before you get to that custom. Just to get into the country. And those forms get processed miraculously by some charity running, running off and they just do it. 
so the system works somehow. All that, what they use it for, I don't know. Because it's duplication upon duplication. So they love force. In South Africa, we do exactly the same. We love force. There's not enough conversation, but we love force. We go to court, we get a J101 application form. Why is it called an application form? What do you apply for? What do you apply for? You don't apply for maintenance. Maintenance is not an application, maintenance is right. It's a common law duty of a parent to support his child. It's this, it should not read application, it's wrong. But we've become accustomed to to doing a certain thing, in a certain way. Remember, in South Africa, we've got we've got two systems of maintenance. We've got the public system, and then we've got the private system. The public system is the government grants or the children's grants, and people are getting the mindset of you you go and you stand in a line. That's one of my pet peeves: standing in a line. I hate it if it's in home affairs or Absa Bank or Net Bank or wherever. I hate standing in a queue. Waiting for something. But we've become accustomed to that because we had to do it each and every damn day. You stand in a line and apply for a children's grant. That's the public portion thereof. Why was that all in? Because the damn fathers, the fathers don't pay maintenance. Because apart from the public maintenance procedure, there's also the private maintenance procedure. And that is the common law duty of a father to support his offspring. Simple as that. So application, the form that we need to fill in, should actually be an application, not for maintenance, but an application for the force to intervene so that the father can pay his legal obligation. That is something that we need to learn. Because we, we are accustomed. We want that's what they want. You want to stand in a queue and you want to get something without getting something in return. And that's, that's, the, that's the sad portion. 66 people chose not to be as a person. Why? It's given to them for free. Isn't that a sense of entitlement? Exactly. They woke up this morning and they just decided, oh, you know what, the weather's cut. <laughs> <laughs> the weather's not nice. It's not pleasant. Sorry. And they decided they're not coming. You know what they get that for free? The knowledge they get for free. But they get they choose not to do that. Shouldn't there be a change in behavior on the side and a sense of accountability on the side of people wanting to make maintenance? What, what can I do to make it better for myself? If need be, go and take a piece of bag, go and ask for some seeds, plant something. That's things that you can do as well. So yes, behavioral change. Probably the best thing in India with regards to maintenance of domestic violence is that the focus has shifted completely. It's not about the mom, it's not about the dad, it's about the children. So they focus solely on the children. So much so that the fathers are not forced to pay maintenance, yes they are, but it is not a resentment payment. Because they spin it around to say that you know what's in the best interest of the child. It's all for the child. So they take away the mom and that bitch in the mother. They take that away. They take that away and they focus solely on the child. It's all the best interest of the child. And that is something, although, I, I mean, the Children's Act is 67 references in the Children's Act with regards to the best interest of the child. But yet, you know what? If I stand up in court and I have to argue what is the best interest of the child, then it's difficult. Because what is the best interest of the child? Maybe we should have that dialogue, one year to say, that discussion. What is meant? Because you know what? For me, the best interest of my child, sitting there, is yet. It's different than someone that grew up in the township. The best interest of that child is different to what I perceive as the best interest of my child now. That is conversations that we need to have as attorneys, as mediators, as judiciary, as court personnel, so that they understand the dynamic. The shift should be the best interest of the child. In short, we should actually be more proactive than being reactive. 
Don't wait for the shit hits the fan and you're right in front of her. Oh, well, chances are that the fan's not on with a load shift. That's also good. <laughs> but, but when the proverbial shit hits the fan, don't wait for it. Don't wait for it. Be proactive. You know what? Go out. Get a packet of seeds. Find something. Because you know what? You'll reap the benefit thereof in a couple of months' time when you can actually have the spinach or the, or the tomatoes or whatever. You can give that to your child, regardless of if the father pays maintenance. Um, I discussed most of this. Probably one of them, bringing it into South African context, I think we should manage our own expectations. We should manage the expectations of mothers going to court. That is important. Because they go there to court with a certain expectation to be helped immediately. And it never happens. And they leave being disappointed. And they are defaming the court personnel. They're defaming the courts. And that's wrong. We should manage the expectations. And the only way that we can manage expectations is through advocacy and through teaching and through learning, through workshops and get together and open dialogues such as these. That is how we educate people to manage the expectations. Obviously, training and, and education, like I said, uh, pre pre uh, provide consistency, I've mentioned, and also the community involvement. You know what, Gary said that we, we, we operate in silos, and you know what, we do. But we should all come together and work together. Because I've got certain strengths, apart from swimming the left a little bit. And I've got certain strengths. So is Steve. But so does Steve, which is actually Quindalos. <laughs> <laughs> but if he wants to be Steve, he does it. So we all work in silos, but we, at one stage there should be a collaboration. We should get the community involved. We should get other people involved so that you can play to your own strengths. And you can write this has got certain strengths. He's the one giving everybody hope. He's part of the on. Yes, he gives everybody hope. <laughs> Sometimes I'm the son of reason. <laughs> I'm bound by the LPC, so the legal practice guys that you want to do. So yes. But, it, but we do make a good team. Other people as well. I mean, I think about Felicity, for example. I mean, she speaks her mind because she can. She advocates for a certain thing that she feels strongly about, which is good, but that's her strength. I cannot do that because I'll be gagged by the healthy seat. John would be fired because he works for the NBA. <laughs> so each should work with their own strengths and collaborate and come together for the betterment of the. Uh, of, of the maintenance system. That brings me to the next slide, please. That basically, that was my Indian experience. And I wish everybody could go there and they could see how humble these people are. They are really the most humble people in the worst situation. Um, but it's, it's a poor country, uh, I kid you not. Um, I have not seen areas and slums where I, I was in the years. Um, you would not believe the conditions of, of those people, but yet they choose. They've got the, the mental attitude of not going down, but going forward. And that is absolutely brilliant. So my wish for all of you would be, if you can ever go to India, if you want to join me to go to India, send me a mug, we'll take all of you. <laughs> um, because that's what you're passionate about. It. Right, so that brings me to, to the education part and the um, the advocating of education training, getting them to the community involved as well. So what we what we are doing um, is creating 52, it started off with only 52, 52 weekly webinars. Three webinars during lunchtime. We can actually eat your we have for the little brewing kit in and, and a cup of coffee and you can listen to a couple of experts on a certain topic. So we started with maintenance, but ever since uh, Aaron joined us, the, um, we'll, we will expand that to children's rights um, and domestic violence as well. So the intention is to, and that would be done each and every week from the 1st of February. So it will, there will be a webinar for about 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, there will be a short discussion, and then there will be time for questions and answers. And that will be given out, that will be streamed live, 
um, on our website, on, on, on the website lunchandlearn.org.za. Um, we have to register for that, and you also get the course material. There would be pre reading material, so there is some homework that you can do beforehand, you know, just some history about what is going to be discussed. Then it would be the webinar, and then the discussion portion, and it would also be made available complete handout. You would have a complete handout of what was said. I urge you, if you attend to, to, to sit in on those webinars, to get yourself free hours in the park. Because if you print out everything that is going to be said on those webinars, together with all the case books, all the legislation, all the templates that you need, be it complaints to the magistrate or how to fill in a J101, you probably need about three leave arch files, which we will, which we will um, be discussing during the course of the year. Um, the upcoming one, like I said, the first one would be um, on the 1st of February. Um, just some topics, I'm not going to go into all of them. Things that you should know before you apply to for maintenance, which is quite important. Um, how to get all the documents ready when you apply. What documents do you need? Obviously, my favorite, how to complete the J1014. Very important, how to calculate the child's expenses, the parent's contribution, how to, how to actually submit the documents to court. Um, how to conduct, conduct a Section 6 inquiry. Put me on a couple of slides, please. Um, other topics, another one? Yes, other topics include, include how this is becoming all the technical stuff. And, and there is where some of the maintenance officers and maybe some of the magistrates will join as well. Um, how does paper spouse and maintenance work? Um, very important. How do you interpret documents presented during a Section 6 and Section 10 inquiry? You know what? You are requested with your banking statements. You know what? Who looks at them? I've seen maintenance officers, they file, and I take the file, and I say, right, you know what, we have to go to court now with this. And there's no mark, there's no indication. It's just, the, it's just the banking statement. So I said, all right, what was the first, how did you ask the banking statement? Mm -hmm. No, the yeah, okay. objective <laughs> says. <laughs> the director says, oh, you get the banking statement for this help. <laughs> what do you do with it? Nothing. How do you do it? So we will have we will we will be having a, a, a financial guide um, specializing in forensic audit to explain that in more detail as well. So you know what what do you have to look out for? On a banking statement, what patterns do you have to look out for? What can you what can you see? Because there's much more. I love going to somebody's banking statement. Oh <laughs> man, you get some stories. But yeah, that's that's that, that's a, another ball game. Uh, next slide, next, next two slides. Um, there will also be panel discussions. Now, this is where it's going to get interesting. No, one more back. Yes, some panel discussions. Um, very contentious issues, such as is mediation a viable solution to solve maintenance matters? I want to get a panel together over a lunch time. Let them fight it out. Let's get two legal people, two mediators, two idiots. And bring them all together <laughs> and see what transpires. Because we might have some fun. You know what? It would be engagement. There would be talks. And people would start talking about that. Hopefully, some people of the DRJ and the PA and the Law Reform Commission also link in. And this way. But that's going, to be, that's going to be interesting. Those are the conversations that we want to have. Creating not a conflict situation, but bring people together in a similar conflict situation and see how they resolve it. Very much a mediative, mediative process. Um, also, how does attorneys, um, how attorneys and their clients misuse the judiciary? Um, I'm on the ethics committee of the LPC, and that was a question that I also raised a while ago. Um, if someone uses vexatious litigation, the vexatious litigator brings you to court every and every time, each and every time, would that be considered a good abuse? Very well. <laughs> of course, that could be considered. Yes, that could be considered. If you have to pay each and every time you go to court, you have to spend your own money and you use your own savings. That would be considered economically, economically, right? So that person could actually be charged with economic abuse. True? Yes. So what would happen if that person is represented by an attorney and he actually says, you know what, your your client comes to me and says, but I've got instruction, delay the matter. 
motor drive. How ethical is that? There's a very fine line, and I want to bring some people in to discuss that because I think that's also a conversation that is that is needed. So on the next slide, please. So it would be open for legal practitioners, maintenance officers, NGOs, anyone that, that wants to listen to my voice, some of the other people's voices. Um, I've got a team of people working for me. Uh, far away to just stand up here. That's my daughter. She started off as a candidate attorney last week. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she has been busy with lunch and learn research at Compiling Council. The next one next to her is Erin O'Neill. She's also a clerk at Stand Up Erin. She is, there's, there's a couple of more, which is not here today. Um, they are, Erin's been doing most of the, of the children's acting stuff. Um, but we still need someone to do mediation stuff. Because I can't get to that. I'll do some stuff on, on divorces as well. So the invitation is open to anyone that wants to join in that wants to present one or two sessions, they're most welcome. Drop me a line, there is the, the, the web phone is there, the email address is also there. Please do, please do get involved. If you have a topic that you want to discuss, we've got a template of the slideshow, we'll give that to you, I'll help you with that. Um, we can report that prior to that, so you don't have to be on air because people are scared. This is just a they're scared of talking in front of people. So you'll be in front of a camera, so that would be fine. So if you feel comfortable, feel strongly about that, you know what, I urge you, please do. We need more people. We need more people getting involved. That would be brilliant. That leading up to the next one, I'm nearly finished. Uh, the next one is the proposed, next slide please, is the proposed maintenance summit. Um, in conjunction with the Institute for Social Development and Justice, we are proposing that a maintenance summit be held. It will probably be held up our talks on Monday with the <coughs> University of Stellenbosch to, to use their facilities um, in, in presenting, in collaboration with them, pro bono, there's, there's a couple of companies. The more people that want to get involved, the better. But to have a at least three-day summit, I don't want to call it a conference, it's, it's, it's yeah, everybody talks about conference or, or what do you call it, collective or what do you want? The other names that you guys call it? Yeah, I've yeah. never heard of, I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> I don't want that. So I said, you know, summit is, you know, summit, summit indicates something that's summit. on the top and it's yes. peaky pe pe and, 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 and people, and that's something that you can strive for. So, so I like the word summit. Um, we will have guest speakers, we can present it active participation via means of our table discussions. We can actually engage in conversation and, and voice their views. Um, inclusiveness and discussions, relevant topics that will be discussed. Um, and then that the idea would be to establish a national forum of collaboration where people attending that either online or in person could collaborate afterwards to say, you know what, let's work together and not work in silos. Different. Uh, then there's also the open invitation to um, anyone present, listening online or present here, um, to, to become a volunteer, um, to help with the marketing of the, uh, the maintenance summit, to be a guest speaker or even just a participant. Uh, please get in touch. Um, and we will also invite nominations for keynote speakers. Of course, there's um, probably two that's in the pipeline. Um, He's the Chancellor of, of Stalin Bosch, um, Judge Cameron. Um, to him. Probably Judge Daniel Kulari, if he's possible. Um, so there's, there's, there's a couple of people that has already been identified with regards to being guest speaker, speaker of honor. Um, if you have any suggestions and ideas, I simply don't have time to, to do everything myself uh, and the team that I have. We, we simply can't do everything, everything myself. So we'd love the participation of other people as well. Um, if you want to contact us on the next slide, thanks Natalie. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of email addresses where you can contact me on any of those um, if you want to join and just want to have more information. Uh, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. Thank you so much. That's what we mean with like-minded people.
Page 59 and page 60, there is an article of a person, a wonderful dear colleague of mine, her name is Roxanne Janssen, and she wrote an article that was published in the uh, 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 during the month of December, and that article specifically is dealing with um, lying in expenses. Okay. Oh, Okay, all right, I'll try and explain then. But uh, the article is about lying in expenses, that is in terms of section 16 of the Maintenance Act. Page 59 and page 60 of the Maintenance of our handout. But um, this. Janssen knows this article pertaining to uh, maintenance and pertaining to, uh, to lying in expenses, uh, specifically how a lady can claim lying in expenses. Uh, I can't find the presentation now, I know it, so I'll just speak of art now. Uh, so, what you need to know whenever you're dealing with lying in expenses, it is uh, in terms of section 16 of the maintenance act. In normal words, what does it mean? Back pay. Mm -hmm. A lady has been started for months or she doesn't know she can go and maintenance. And eventually she finds out that she can approach the maintenance court and she can get the maintenance for all the times that he didn't pay in on the Cape Flats we got a, 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 a name for it. Or he went to the buy something. Yeah. Now that is what uh, it is all about. It's where the father deserts the lady at the pivotal time when she needs his support. That is what it is, and it's called lying in expenses. Isn't there a slide available? So, lying in expenses in terms of section 16 is where you then apply for. The period that the uh, father did not assist you. The bad part about it, and um, uh, Eugene pointed it out in the J101 uh, maintenance application form, that is the full form, application form to apply for maintenance. They do not provide for lying in expenses. In most cases, when you're going to go to the court, the court is not going to tell you that you can do lying in expenses. You can't. Claim or that you can claim, uh, if I can put it in other words, back pain. You can't get back pain. That's what some people tell you. In terms of section 16.1a, Roman numeral 2, you can claim it. You can claim it from the date of birth up until the day of the inquiry. Now, why is this word lying in expenses not used? Because you will never find lying in expenses. In the maintenance legislation, there's no such word in the maintenance legislation. Because if you do a Google search on what lying expenses entails, it entails the expenses that the child or that the mother experienced or incurred during the period of pregnancy and the period of the uh, labor and then afterwards the period of the birth. Now, the reason why the legislature obviously decided not to use that word is because <clears throat> lying in expenses is actually just for birth and the period after birth. That's what's lying in expenses. Section 60 goes a little bit further. It says that lying in, lying in expenses is from the date of birth until the date of the inquiry. So if you didn't get any money from the date that your child was born, up until the day that you are sitting in front of the maintenance officer with the father or the respondent, they call him the respondent, the father, when you sit in front of the court, 
in which you can go to the same thing to play it for that specific job on your own without the user system, you can claim as the IND experience. And as I want to say that again, the reason why the IND experience is not because nobody seems to understand it is because the maintenance tax takes it further than what the term the experience on Google will tell you. Google will tell you line the experiences from the date of birth, the birth period, and the period after birth. It doesn't include when the child is two or three years old and went to the site, all of that. No, that's not lying in the experiences. Lying in the experiences is the birth and after birth. That is lying in the experiences. And because the legislator thought that it is better to take it a step further and also look at that period where you and all the child in the site, and where you decided to have other expenses. Because that day when you get to the maintenance required and you want to get your consent order that is on page 49 of your handout, where Ms. Uh, Roxanne Janssen speak about it, and you get what we call a J214 consent order. Once you get that consent order, and that's the end of it, then you can't claim lying expenses. Lying expenses can only be claimed in a case where there's no order in place. The moment the J214 is signed, then you go on to what about my back pain here? What about the, the amount that he didn't pay when he deserted me? You can't claim. In the case of a divorce, where the divorce was already concluded and there was no rule for the claim dealing with any expenses. You can't then come and say, look, but I still want lying expenses. I attended a conference on Saturday, it was raining, and I was here. I heard about lying expenses, and now I want to claim lying expenses. It's not going to work. Section 16 is clear where there's no order in place. The magistrate listened to you after hearing the, the, uh, the testimony or the evidence that is abused, either on paper or in an affidavit or before booking. All evidence, all of that is abused, then the decision is made on lying experiences, whether that person will qualify for lying experience. So, what do you do in a case where you've never heard of it and your child is now three years old? Now you will be going to look for old slippies, buy the old slippies, house burned down so there's no more slippies. What do you do in those cases? In those cases, what I recommend you do is go on stats SA. On Stats SA, you will get the statistics of how much the average expense is for a child in 2018. How much was the average expense for a child in 2019? So on the uh, UCT uh, uh, children's um, uh, law, uh, you will also find some articles pertaining to how much it costs to raise a child per year. So don't worry if you don't have all the slippies, all the receipts, because the first thing the maintenance officer is going to ask you, how are you going to go with where the slippies, if you don't have slippies, then you can at least work on an average and say that for 2019, okay, I don't know how much it was, but and on average, uh, stats SA says this is how much it costs to raise a job. Okay, I'm, I'm willing to accept that. At least you get something instead of getting nothing. So let's rather work with that instead of going towards nothing to court. Because the court is going to be clear on you. You can't come out and say that I want lying expenses uh, to be paid by the um, uh, court, and then the court asks you how much you want to say, well, how much can I ask? Because I see there's another place to go to where, where people say, I'm going to the maintenance court, how much can I ask? You need to know what your expense of your child is. That's the starting point. If you don't know how much it costs for you to raise your child, then how can you ask the court and ask the court to do it for you? Because the child that is being raised in Bishop Labors is different from the child that is being uh, raised in Bishop School. That's what also came out now here in uh, Dean's store. There is those social classes that we need to take cognizance of. Otherwise, you're going to get magistrates that will say, okay, I'm sitting there and all the cases over here is 1,000, all right, make a 1,000. While you know only the transport to get the child to the crash, that's already a thousand. Right? So if you're not going to come with the information to court, there's no way the court can help you. But then people and they will say, oh, it's okay, I thought people made it up there. It will not work for you if you are not willing to help yourself. 
And the purpose of helping yourself is to educate yourself. If 66 people didn't think it is worth for them to come over here today, it shows at the end of the day the, the mentality of the subject of the public. So they want everything for free. We could have charged for this. This is being offered for your job. This is costing a lot of money. <laughs> and nobody thinks even the audacity to have the honor of coming over here and listening to what these people that have I know what Carl and, and um, uh, Carl and yes. Mr. Oberman is doing. I've seen the work that they are putting into this lunch and learn. And if people well, really want to show appreciation, then they will register for the first of February. It was all of the information that is on Facebook. Film the car, how much was I asked? All of those questions are going to be answered. It is just for you to access that services. But if you don't even want to access the services where a person is going to avoid this man of everybody who is this man, is a friend of ours, uh, myself, as well as uh, Natalie. Um, he came all the way from our way. I asked him, can I come and fetch you? He said, no, I will get there myself. Wow. That shows that he has an interest in it and he wants to participate. He himself is hard of hearing, but he's learning sign language in order to be able to help somebody else in the deaf community that can't hear. That is what we are looking for. Like minded people that have the same interest and want to go out there and help others. If we're not going to get there, we're going to be wasting our time. There are a lot of like minded people sitting here that I'm aware of. And I want to ask you if you want to please assist. So, and the way we help one another is one by one we will get the Mr. Alexander Jansen took time to help this uh, to write this article on page eight of the directors that's in page fifty nine on this document. <coughs> Take time to read it. That's the least respect you can show to her for all the time that she put in it. Mr. Opperman and his team is putting a lot into having these actions. And I saw what he was doing. And it's time that we appreciate those type of things. The information is out there. It's time that we need to tap into the, the points and some of us, the Royal State, um, Hunter Trading State. With all these people that are willing to share their information, Mr. Vietor, or Vietor, that is, uh, uh, Minister Vietor, that is very busy and flew all the way from the United States to be here in order to honor each and every one of you. And that is what it's about. If people do not appreciate what others are willing to do for them and will help themselves, then unfortunately there's nothing more any of us will be able to do for anyone that is sitting in this room. Come back to section 59. So, what you need to know is you can claim back pay. Back pay meaning you can claim for any of the expenses incurred by the mother in the case where the father deserted her and in some way did not contribute to it. And you can go back to whatever the period is. Even if it's 60,000 and it's not only 60,000, you must say how I'm going to pay it off. It's not your baby, how he got there, he got himself there. And if we start doing these things and making sure that the message go out there, then that's what we need to do. In Mr. Eugene Opperman's work that he started on WhatsApp, people are being empowered, his mothers being empowered in that work, and some of them are online listening to this dialogue now. And what they are doing now is whenever they have got summoned, they will tell others. I'm going to Simon's Town. Is there any other lady going to Simon's Town? I'm going to be forming a love club in order to help the lady in front of you. Page 84, um, uh, 84, they make copies of the information brochure. They make extra copies and they share it with the person sitting next to them and tell them this is the information that's out there. And please, if you want to uh, read it at your own leisure or give it to somebody else. I went to Stray's Bar in December, and in Stray's Bar I found a, a, 
an elderly man that came over there and they had a, uh, uh, a pamphlet that Reader in Mitchell's playing with Bob, um, his, and he's also on here. And he just heard that we are going to be there. And he asked for where's Miss Miss Cornelia and he was. And they had a shovel piece of, of this pamphlet that we gave him, which explained that he had with him, and they held on to that. That is the appreciation that people show right? that they appreciate what others are willing to interpret. Miss Cornelia is having a book that when she's taking care of all the ladies in the Mitchell Plain. Every night I see how she's busy. Complete the J1, same story, over to J101. No go there, no one speaks to this person, complain there. The magistrate is I want to do this, but she do. She do that every single day. And there was an article in the Plainsman regarding that. But what I'm saying is, let us inculcate what we learn over the year and share that with one another. That way, the injustice cannot happen against somebody that's informed. If you are informed, there's no way they can tell you, but if you say section 16, 1, 8, Roman rule, numeral 2, C, then I can get back pay from the date of birth until the date of the inquiry that is today, then that is what you show me. And there is on page 59. Take that document with you, or tell it to your neighbor, or tell it to the sister in your congregation, and that's how we get the message out. As Mr. Opperman said, we're going to have these type of not colloquiums, the summits and all of that. So let us get all of these information. This place is going to be a center of excellence. We'll share this information so that everyone knows where there it is. The how many people are here? Well, let's get some key study for the 50 people that's here and will be 20 people that are online of the 77 that are registered online or whatever the case might be. But let us share that information amongst the other Everything that Mr. Offerman do is for your charge. But the moment it's for your charge, nobody comes. Mm -hmm. But the moment you have to face charge, I'm the only Then you want to say that. But whenever it is supposed to be that you need to pay for something, then you've got a problem with it. Then you get free of charge and you still don't want to take it. So what more must you do? I have a problem with South African public. Complaining and uh, every time say, Yana, yeah, uh, Dallas, not to say, there's nobody that wants to help me. These people are helping. But if people don't want to be out, they sit with that type of victim mentality. And if we're not going to change it in this year, in January, 28 January of 2023, if we don't start here, then we will have magistrates like the magistrates over there in the back, magistrates that open stuff of you, my standing. A uh, very dear colleague of mine uh, is a magistrate, um, and I was going to say we, but he's one of my colleagues that I see how he struggles and how he fights to get maintenance orders for women in the courts where he sits. Next to him is Mr. Michael Pixel. Michael, can you stand? A legal advisor at the uh, Department of Education. Uh, the, what department is now? Yes, he's a um, colleague of mine as well as uh, he's calling, I just forgot his name now. But all the legal disorders will be in the back. Please uh, reach out to them. They've got a wealth of knowledge more than what uh, I am. So let us share it. There's a gentleman, another one of them, but Mr. Kasuki, if you can say, this is a retired maintenance investigator. He retired last year, no, two years ago. Um, but still, um, and he injured himself and he's got a problem with his one foot. But despite him having a problem with his foot, he walked with that so quickly and he got him down here. But 66 others do not think it is going to work for him to come because it's our injury. And he come with that mentality, and I think you deserve to sit in the maintenance room and sit there for the next, another 18 months. But do not come and complain and say that you didn't get services. Because the service is not the information is the just use it. We will empower you and we will make the NSP paragraph or qualify for your forces. We must empower and strengthen the maintenance force. Let it start here. Let's make this a center of excellence. 
You've got a wonderful speaker that is expert in the field. Let us start and use those ones. That's my sermon on the mount. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say anything else uh, except that lying in expenses, if you have any problems, there's a lot of information on www.childmenu.org.za. You will find a lot of information over there. Okay, I want us to move on to the next speaker before we get to that. And um, uh, it's a person close to my heart, and I won't say how close, but uh, a person that has been writing a lot about mediation for years. So let's start mediation. We did dining in December in um, uh, George, and uh, we were uh, dining the Department of Justice's maintenance clerks, and uh, she came and gave her information on mediation and how mediation is progressing and how people should be using maintenance as a vehicle and tool and how it is being uh, been, uh, being proposed by the SA Law Commission. So without explaining anything further, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Matthew Director so will present on um, the uh, mediations in maintenance matters. The SA Law Commission uh, a paper 157 on mediation that will be um, out soon. And in this paper, um, uh, paper 157 and chapter 2, there's a session uh, or section on uh, mediation specifically and what happened with mediation in South Africa. So I, uh, I requested her to do the presentation on um, mediation and maintenance. <coughs> Uh, over to uh, Natalie, sorry, Kesh. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to be here today, and I just feel the energy of 23. Um, I'm trying to say, John, I'm trying to put a picture. Okay, then I can't do both. Um, so, I feel the energy of 323, and um, as I drove into town, I'm sure many of us drove into town today, I don't know who saw this overarching radio. It was so beautiful. And I think all of us collectively sitting here and those online, we are that overarching rainbow to our nation. I know that our economy, the courts, um, and just a lot of homes and people are feeling very broken and clouded like the clouds we saw behind them at Rainbow. But collectively, online and in the room, we collectively make that colorful rainbow, bringing light to that rainbow, to, to, to the clouds out there. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about um, the progressive amendments. Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about the progressive amendments in our jurisprudence and the development of mediation in the maintenance matters. I will be referring to paper 157 that was introduced by the South African Law Reform Commission last year. And the aim was really to introduce mediation within maintenance matters in the court. So I've also become very aware that mediation but there's our rainbow, <laughs> um, as all of us collectively. Let me go to my slideshow. Oh, <laughs> presentation. <laughs> okay, I'm mad. I'm mad. So you listen to the dog box. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> anyway, um, I've become very aware that mediation is not understood for its depth and its breadth and the valuable tool that it can be. So for all the mediators in the room and those of us online, and thank you to um, Derek and to like uh, Laurie and Annika and the many other mediators that speak about the useful tool of mediation. It is our mandate that we continue to do advocacy around what a valuable tool it is. Um, we have seen in the last year or two that mediation seems to be the new buzzword around. So people are getting divorced, people are having struggles in the maintenance court, uh, parenting plan issues, and everybody's like, do mediation. But they don't really understand what mediation is. Um, I would also like to say that even though it's a new buzzword and 
it has been building a lot of momentum. It is not all new to South Africa. So our South African jurisprudence um, began exploring the concept of ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, in the early 1980s. And in 1983, the Hoxter, the Hoxter Commission um, wrote a report where they recommended that ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, be used in family disputes. And we see this um, echoed and sort of reaffirmed in paper 148, which I'll make reference to as well. The Hector Commission also noted that that will still assist us, our adversarial system, or any adversarial system across the world, is never and has never been in the best interest of the child. And I think 38 years later, we're all beginning to nod and say the adversarial system has never been in the interest of the child. They also noted that our jurisprudence needed to follow a more inquisitorial approach in family matters like in the divorce matters. So then we fast forward to 2010, where there was an endorsement from the DOJ, who recommended that we implement um, ADR as a mechanism to resolve civil disputes. And it also gave rise to what we know as the Generic Mediating Act. Um, it also, the DOJ, that, um, that uh, it also gave rise to encouraging court in next and court exposed mediation. And so there was a lot of talk in the background and a lot of push from DOJ and many others. And we fast forward to February 2020. So in February 2020, um, Rule 41A was introduced into the High Court, it's one of the uniform rules of the High Court. And basically, there's just a rule that stipulates that any parties in a dispute should seek mediation before going the legal route or uh, pursuing litigation. Since 2020, uh, February 2023, because of the overburden court roles that was happening and people weren't getting fast, um, uh, cases weren't being closed enough, uh, the computer fast enough, a lot of mad uh, because of COVID and the sanitizer closing down the buildings and, you know, um, uh, you know, sanitizing buildings and the buildings and the courts were closed, there was a huge backlog of cases that were not resolved within the court system. So magistrates and court officials began to do a lot more quarter next um, refer uh, cases for mediation and there has been such great success and momentum from this case. Um, last year part of that momentum was pay, uh, the SA Law Commission introduced a paper, paper 157. It was um, a discussion paper around the review of the Maintenance Act 1999 of 1998. Um, and really, it's the amendments around the, the, the current maintenance act that we, we know. What was really exciting about this paper was that chapter two was by far the biggest chapter um, and the longest chapter in this discussion paper. They dedicated 52 pages to speak around and discuss around implement, implementing <coughs> mediation within the maintenance court. And really just showing that mediation can be a useful tool in uh, family law and trying to resolve the issues you find in the maintenance court. Now, I know many in this room and online did submissions to this paper. And for those who haven't done the submission, we will still have a chance, hopefully this year, when it goes to Parliament for um, its parliamentary deliberations, and we will keep you posted on that process. But I was really excited about this paper because I have seen mediation bring successful agreement between parents at least, between parents in a dispute around um, either maintenance or parenting back for parenting. Um, it, it, it really gives both parents parties an opportunity to hash out things that are not certain that cause a resistance or um, and, and resistance that sometimes the fathers resist to pay maintenance is underpinning issues like um, and there's a resistance to paying uh, maintenance or the mother finds a need to withhold the child from the other parent. And unless you deal with these underpinning issues in a space, in a safe space of mediation, I have seen that you can draft the best parenting plans that can look so pretty, um, the most thought out um, maintenance uh, plans, 
But if there are these underpinning issues that are causing rise to the dispute and the anger and the tension and the sort of relationship between the parents, it's really hard to try and comply with these facts. The point that I really want to bring up in paper 157 is on page 52. And it recommends that section 6 be amended to 4A. It says, after investigating, the, after investigating the application or complaint, the maintenance officer must advise the parties to attempt to resolve the matter through mediation, which can be provided for by one a private mediator whose cost must be shared equally between the applicant and the respondent unless they be otherwise. Two, if a mediator is available, um, a community-based mediator whose cost, if any, must be shared by the applicant and the respondent unless they be otherwise. And three, the maintenance officer is in the matter. Now, this is the point, point three, I would like to bring to the discussion today. And just quickly, a show of hands, I'm going to take four people, a general show of hands, who feels that maintenance officers have the capacity to do mediation within maintenance issues? Okay, so we've got one show of hands. Okay. So I'm taking that the rest of us are in the consensus that we feel maintenance officers don't have the capacity to do mediation within maintenance. Okay. Um, But before we discuss that very point, I also want to go a bit forward and just show you how mediation is really being cemented within our new, um, our new legal framework. And we see this um, in a discussion paper that was paper 148 that was introduced also by the South African Law Reform Commission last year, July. Um, in this paper, it was a very comprehensive paper around you know, mediation and family disputes and it was a wonderful paper, there was a lot of good in it. The really exciting thing for me is that on page 111, it makes mention to a mediation goal that is going to be introduced. We're hoping that goal will be introduced at time this year. And soon after that, last year in August, there was a political party that felt the need to do a party member's goal in Parliament. Um, and their recommendation was that Section 14 of the Maintenance Act would include mediation within the maintenance space. Now, I think we can see that we are, um, the current discourse across the board is really seeking and cementing that mediation becomes a very big part of our jurisprudence. What is also, and I make mention of this political party, I don't know anything about politics in the worst <laughs> when it comes to it, but the reason I make mention of a political party is hopefully next month or the month after we will have a wonderful guest speaker. She's going to come in and she's going to teach us how to do advocacy and lobbying in, um, in politics. For a lot of the painful issues that we've seen within the court, we can collectively come together, start writing our submissions, get our submissions ready, and she will coach us and guide us through the process in how to collectively lobby in Parliament for the changes we want to see within maintenance, gender-based violence, and you know, sort of our nation and our law. Um, so one of the things she does refer to, or she always says, is get to know who the leaders of your political party are that are in line with your cause. Because these are the very people that will be our voice in Parliament when we begin to when we send our submissions into the lobby. So before we go back to that point that I brought up the discussion, um, whether maintenance officers have the capacity to uh, mediate, I think it's important we understand mediation. But I think Derek did a wonderful presentation. I don't have to go over what mediation is, or kind of like what a um, safe space is I love to create, because he's a wonderful job. But I will just touch on it quickly. Um, mediation is really a safe place, a safe space that gives parties the opportunity to be honest, have raw and vulnerable conversations with the intent to find a resolution that all parties can live with. 
and I like to use the word live with because one of the myths about mediation is that it will always be a win win situation. And the truth of the matter is it's never a win win situation, only sometimes. At all outcomes of fighting, only sometimes. But in a safe space where you begin to take um, responsibility for the hurt that you're causing, or the unjust that you're doing, or the hurt, yeah, the offense that you're committing within that relationship, you then have that. You, you, you then begin to do the self introspection and begin to change course in how you relate and interact with the other person, that, with the relationship that's built on coexist. And what happens in this in, in a mediation session is concessions are being made, boundaries are being reinforced, and agreements are collectively being made between the parties. And what I've found out, or what I think any mediator will say, is that we have seen that when parties come to an agreement together, when they make those concessions together, when they re, um, when they rephrase what those boundaries look like, chances are they are more likely to comply with the agreement and the outcome than something that's been forced upon them by a magistrate or the law. The one thing that when I sit with my um, clients, before I start in mediation, the one thing I always say to them is, guys, we need to hear each other. And I stress the word here because it's in the hearing that we have deep understanding and we change direction in our behavior. I also have seen in mediation that sometimes parties are so caught up in their right to be right. They, um, they're hurt, why they're sitting there, why they should be there, and why they're having this conversation, and they're not hearing. So in the mediation space, I literally slow the party down. Like I slow that party down, I bring them back into the room, she back into the room, and I say, yeah, just here, just here. And Yeah, and in that process, we begin to reframe things and, become, and, and really just find the agreement, come to agreement together. Um, it's a chance to really unpack the issues that underpin certain um, behaviors. So I just want to give a quick story of a mediation that I did. Um, and I spoke about the underpinning issues where a father can have a relationship to its pain maintenance or a mother can have a, a need to withhold the child. And I did a mediation where the father called me and said to me, I would like to pay this maintenance. So I want to go to mediation. I was like, okay. So we I speak to mom, and mom says she's quite surprised because dad has paid on time, all the time, and she's never had to ask for money. So she was a part of that. But she was open to mediation, and we did mediation together. In the session, as we went down to all the expenses, there was an intent. It was really like um, the new dad. And it was an amount of 370 rand that was split between both parents. And as we unpacked it, it the expense was for A time and daughter for child B. 370. And as we were unpacking it, I was like, okay, dad, why are you why are you digging with that half of the 370? And dad says, Well, let me tell you. I bought a cell phone for child A and I paid cash for that cell phone as a birthday gift. And mom went and bought a cell phone for child B, but she put it put it on contract and the contract is 370. And that was his birthday gift. So in essence, I'm paying for the child's birthday gift from mom, which is she didn't contribute to my my birthday gift to child A. And I said, okay, that makes some sense. So we went back to child A. Child A has a cell phone that's paid off. How much airtime and data are we giving child A? And it turns out that it was 200 grand, 100 grand, 100 grand airtime from both parents. So I said, okay, would it be fair enough if we gave child B the same amount of airtime, 200 grand, or airtime and data combined, 200 grand, 100 grand from dad, 100 grand from mom, and mom, seeing that it's your gift to child B, do you feel that you can absorb the cost of 170 rand? She's like, wow, I never thought of it like that. 
said, yes, I'm happy and I'm really, she said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I um, charged you, not charge you, I asked for money to with my birthday gift to Kathy. Dad, of course, was smiling, he was saying, okay, 170 rand. But the point is, Dad was hurt. We came to agreements that both of them felt like they can comply with and they were happy with. And I think that's what I'm trying to drive across. I don't think the maintenance officers have the time to unpack and to hear why dad is saying, I don't want to pay 170 rand. It's not a lot of money in the big scheme of things. The dad is just saying it's the principle. That's his principle. And he had to communicate that to mom. And through communicating it to mom, she took ownership and said, you're quite correct. Okay, that's a little story I want to share. Um, another thing that I'd also like to make mention is, I see this and I hear it all the time, is sometimes uh, dads phone me and they say, I don't actually want to pay maintenance for my Okay, why? And they're like, because I have no access to my children. Now, in the maintenance court and system, there's no time to begin to unpack. The underpinning reason or need the mom has to call the child from but through a space of mediation, and I've seen one or two cases that I've done where the mother said, I'm not sure to the child. Rather, let's reframe what the boundaries look like. Dad cannot drop child's home at 9 o'clock in the evening when child has to have bath time, you know, be fed and be there by half past seven, eight. So dad is more than welcome to have the kid, but let's reframe what the boundaries look like. And once dad agrees to that and acknowledge that, he's more likely to want to pay his maintenance. So if we do not create the safe spaces for parents, his co-parents, to have these safe and vulnerable conversations, um, then a lot of our parenting plans and maintenance plans will not be uh, complied with. And we'll see the cues that we're seeing and the complaints that we're seeing um, on that. I also take um, mediation as an opportunity to educate parents. Sure. So I'm a background in psychology and counseling, and so I often speak into the different age, uh, sort of level ages the children are in. And some of the things I explain to the mother is, you know, by the, withholding the child, of causing psychological, emotional, long-term damage for your child. Then so that, that you cannot even begin to fathom, and that can cost you far more than what you're actually fighting over. Um, it's really sad. I mean, I've seen children, and like I said, it's an education, educational space, but I've seen parents where they're saying their children are nail biting because of their anxiety they feel when hand over time. Um, I did a situation with mom and dad were just so angry, and the energy, I could feel it in the passage when I, you know, welcome them in, was so heavy. And then the mom tells me, he's 10 years old and he needs a scribe. And I'm like, you really cannot be surprised if this is the way you're behaving with each other. So it's an educational space to re really educate the parents on the harm that they are doing to their child with their behavior. And I don't feel like any problems have like that. So, yeah, also looking at the role of, the, of a mediator, I think I've covered it. Um, but yeah, it's really to hold a safe space for the parties to share deeply around their hurt and their discussion. Uh, it is my job to contain the room and to facilitate constructive conversation. Sure. Now, a mediation is not a case to bend and bend and speak bad about the other parents. And those kind of, it's really a place to be honest and to resolve those issues. And in, when I see conversations are not constructive, I redirect the conversation to what the ideal of the child would be. Um, it is really important that as a mediator we remain neutral in the room at all times because for people to be honest and to share their fears and their concerns, there has to be a non judgmental space. And I always say that room has to be flooded with grace. Like grace has to flood that room for people just to bring their heart and to say whatever they need to say and to resolve. And I think that's the space of mediation, just to hold the room for the trace. Um, yeah, and I think the last point is that as a mediator, you need to be common sense. You need to be aware of the things that are not in the room. And I know that some maintenance officials do not are not trauma informed, number one. And number two, even if they were trauma informed, 
there's just not enough time. I've been in the court, I see that I, 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 I do for the working court. There's just not enough manpower and skill, uh, manpower rather, to stop, try and attend to the victim or the person that is presenting trauma and find the necessary professionals to help that person who is traumatized. So as a mediator, you need to become informed, you need to recognize what is not being said. When you start to see this abuse, know where to direct you know, the abuse person to get professional help. And so I think after sharing what mediation is and the role of a mediator, we'll go back to the question that I had on point three, um, where paper 151 is recommending that officials, maintenance officials, become or, or, or mediate uh, maintenance issues. Now, Diana and I had the privilege of training some uh, maintenance officials in the Southern Cape last year. For me, it was a real space to gain scope of what they're able to do and not, what they're not able to do. So some of the things we spoke to mediation, and I said, do you interview in the wrong field in terms of mediation? And some said, no, time constraint. One of the officials said, yes. I've done 10 mediations in one day, and I said, I can't even do four. <laughs> you know, it's an emotionally draining process. We give your energy, you know, mediation is about two hours. So if I'm doing four, it's eight hours of my day. And um, I've done that in four and I've been tired and relaxed. So how should it take beyond me? So I said, okay, share, give me your own nuggets. And she said, the longest mediation I've done is 40 minutes. I did 10 in one day, the longest was 40, 40 minutes, and then it was 10 to 15 minutes of mediation. No understanding of mediation. You cannot rush the process for people to unpack. They need to unpack. So that was um, the scope that was given. What I also found out that had horrified me was a lot of these officials have more than one role within the court setting. So there would be like a, a court clerk, a working children's court, there would be a maintenance officer, there would be a business day. Um, there would be a lot of things that I don't even know <laughs> in the court setting. But I just felt it's such an unfair expectation to expect these maintenance officials to then perform a mediation when they have such a huge duty left to get through. And then to be in a room for two hours, try to get that whole list and be present for two parties. It's impossible. Um, I think another question would be oh, a big question around whether they can be. We know that some of the staff, men and staff, are prosecutors, so they from um, the NPA, is that correct? And <laughs> something like that from the NPA. Um, so, would they be able to take off their adversarial hat and put on a restorative justice hat? In my humble opinion, and truth be told, I do not think so. I, mean, I live with one. Um, <laughs> I won't say more. <laughs> I'll give a little story. Um, I was when I was in my training, I was told to have someone senior in the room at the gate. And there were seven people in the room, it was like a whole street to make mediation. And um, so as we're mediating, I'm trying to bring race into the room and I'm just in this space. And Dion was sitting the way he's sitting there, oh, I don't have time for this now. Come, 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 come. And I have to say, Mr. Racist, um, you know, <laughs> so I don't feel that. Prosecutors or any um, uh, I don't have to like court officials was able to take up that before that to put on the court of justice hat and to mediate with us these threats on the table. You guys are not behind and coming to agreement, you know, without any threats coming through. And also, I think the big question is do they have time to train the mediators? My opinion, I don't think so. I think the original stop is in the court. Where are we going to find the time to train court officials to be on the exit? Um, so, a point I would like to say is um, the policy documents of both the MPA and the DOJ, they both state that parties that come into the need to speak with dignity and respect. But I think you've yeah. heard stories, um, personal stories, stories online. Um, and just, you know, people we consult with, they often say, I'm not treated with dignity or respect. And like Jean said, 
it's not that they um, are not able to do it's just the case loads, the amount of people that walk into court but sit in those corridors, it's impossible to give the due um, time which will be interpreted as respect and um, dignity. They just don't have that time. But I think the good news is um, the South African Reform Commission, Paper 157, speaks on mediation and maintenance. Um, so we look forward to see how that will roll out. And lastly, I'd like to say the NSP, the National Strategic Plan, um, set aside one of the objectives is to envision economic empowerment for women. They suggest that if maintenance system is working properly, and women don't have to worry about their children's maintenance, they can focus on self and economic development. Now, if women are having to leave work to sit in the queues to um, sign if they may think that's due to them, hand in hand, mediation is a faster process. So, in mediation, the parties can come to an agreement, consent form is drawn, or an agreement is unsigned, and these can become uh, these can become court orders. That's right. They can become court orders, or you can take them to the um, Office for Family Advocates have them registered and then they are um, enforceable. So if women are having the security known that through mediation agreements have um, been made, they're feeling better about the agreement because it contributed to the agreement, we know that women would then be able to be fully present in their work and they whatever they do to convey their efforts to go uh, home to their children. And so then lastly, one of the benefits of mediation is that it is cost effective. Um, it's much cheaper than having um, following the legal route or getting litigation involved. It is a much quicker and efficient way in the sense that you can resolve issues in one session, maybe two sessions, but it's faster than having to sit in the queue all day, um, you know, and then coming back to court all the time. It's a less adversarial manner. Like I said, a very graceful process, very gentle. And I've seen parties in mediation where dignity has been restored to broken people who walk into the world, being so broken, and so hurt, and so, <coughs> so, 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 so angry. But through a process of mediation, they've been able to literally come on the same page, be kind to each other so that they can co parent. And so, mediation for me is a very magical tool. Um, I think we've run out of time. How much more time? Okay, but lastly, one of the things that I would like to see implemented in the maintenance in the maintenance that it would be um, introduced is the use of integrated electronic repository system. Now, this has been implemented or introduced into the Domestic Violence um, Amendment Act, and I'm hoping that when we begin to draft submissions and we lobby for when it does the requirement. This would be one of our requests that we lobby for that we are able to do any application online because it will reduce mom having to leave work in the day to um, stand in the queues for you know, the courts, as well as it on weekends and in the evening and at their own time. So keep this at the back of your mind as we put our submissions. So where to from here? So like I said, we need to start preparing our submissions. For the parliamentary process. And really, it is something I would like to see change within the main act <coughs> to be implemented in the courts and the justice system. So, begin to compile this. Collectively, we can have um, a submission or we can do individual submissions. But there's such power in a collective um, body. So, I know that a while ago there was an alliance called the Child, Child Justice Alliance, where NGOs, lecturers, and people got together. Pending submission and logged in Parliament for the change that they want to see. I suggest that maybe in this room and online we can form a maintenance alliance. So it could be anyone, any one of us, civil society, legal people, media, whoever wants to see change in our maintenance efforts, let's form this alliance. Let's begin to put our submissions together. So when we know that it's been um, submitted to Parliament and we're able to do our lobbying in Parliament, our submission committee. And I think 
yeah, I think that brings me to the end of my um, presentation. I hope that it was useful and that we will all get together and join this campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Almost there. Uh, the next presentation is going to be a short presentation on living wills. I asked uh, Michaela to come back and just uh, explain to us uh, in the case of living wills, what will happen um, when a person uh, is at a stage where he is close to uh, leaving us and want to somehow still say how this specific world should be dealt with. So uh, Michaela is back and she will explain to us what happens in the case of a living world and what is the mistake from the farmers. <laughs> on what the goal is, what the requirements are for it to be valid, etc. etc. So a goal is basically just a legal document which reflects the last wishes of the testator or the testator to be female and it will stipulate how they want to be assets to the goal that are responsible. Okay? Uh, the goal act does have a few requirements in order for a goal to be given valid and legally enforceable. So the first requirement for a valid will is that it must be signed on each and every page by the testator or the testators. And it must also be signed in the presence of two competent witnesses who must be present at the same time and they will then sign together with the testator or the testators. And let's say, for example, somebody is not able to sign something wrong with the end, not able to sign, sign will not make a mark. A mark would normally be an X or a fingerprint. In that instance, the commission of oath must be also signed the goal. Um, I commissioned the last page there of. That is just to say, okay, I've satisfied myself with the identity of the person who has to have the goal to the last It is important to have a goal for many people, but I just want to point out one or two of those reasons. So, firstly, you can Decide, you have the freedom of the station to decide how you will stay in the world or the world. Obviously, with some limitations, that is the main reason why people have those jobs before you. Also, one of the other reasons is that you can have a supernatural trust created. So you can have a clause in your world where you will have a trust created for specific parties, and norm is normally for minor children. So you pass on before your children reach the age of majority. You can then have a trust created, you can afford a trust in terms of that goal, who will then administer a child's inheritance to say until they reach a specific age, that age will be determined by the case of the <coughs> So let's say you feel when your child is the age of 18, they won't be able to do Or the one that the mental capacity to have handle the finances of the child, you can then push it to expire, but they are ever using it. In that sense, I can hear this is the key to this slide, okay. but I will provide the, the, the most recent slide of the world. Um, the consequences of not having a role. If you don't have a role, you will take the role according to what we call the Interstate Succession Act. The Interstate Succession Act, um, there's, there's many reasons for this. Why you will take all the role will depend on various acts. That is what we have, that is the parameter that we can work with. So if you don't have a goal and your closest blood relationship, the relation is not the person that you would have wanted to be with, unfortunately that is how it would have to be because it's not entirely by the situation of the actors of the world. So they will then make decisions based on who your closest blood relations are, you may or you may if so, how are you married, also the value of your spectrum, so play a role. Um, now I'm going to move on to a living world. 
So a living home is basically a document which contains the person's instruction regarding the work in the black medical case. So in the event that you become incapacitated and you are unable to communicate the issues yourself. So for example, you are in a coma, in a replaced coma, or you are like you are unable to speak, you cannot tell your doctors or your family members what you would want to happen. A living will is not a legal document per se, there is no codified legislation about a living will and why you should have a living will. But it is a good guide because if you have a living will in place, that can guide your medical practitioners accordingly and it will also prevent your family from having to make that decision on your behalf if you are unable to speak for yourself. Even if you become inca mentally incapacitated afterwards, as long, as long as you understood the nature and the, and, the, and the consequences of your actions at the time of signing that living will, it will still be valid. I can't say important things because it's not actually a document, but it will be valid and it will give you guys going forward. Um, in your living will, you have the right to receive any medical treatment or any secondary support system which you would be independent of, dependent on in order to keep your life artificially per se. Um, and you can also make provision in your living world, say you want to go to organ, or you would rather have, want to be buried in the etc. etc. et cetera. That you can also do in your normal testamentary practice, but you can do it in your living world as well. There is a big difference between your Lost one and testament and your living will. So it's two separate documents that can exist in conjunction with each other. One will not cancel the other one out and then use for different reasons. So two more differences that I would like to point out is that a living will would speak for individuals who are unable to speak for themselves at the time that they are alive. And once you pass on that document, it no longer works. We, as your last will and testament, would be the document that could be how you act if it's more than all. That is a legally enforceable document that only becomes legally enforceable after you die. Because while you are alive, you can change it from the time and it's different. And then also, yeah, basically your living will is valid while you are alive, the other one is valid. After you die, and it's used for two totally different reasons, and for that reason, you can have that. Your the organ donation and how you would like to move your remains to do the job of one spot. You can put that in both. So if you have a loving home, you have to make sure that your loved ones, your family members, your doctors, etc., are aware of the existence of the document and they have a copy of it. Because it won't help anybody if the document is in existence, but they don't know at the time that you become incapacitated that you need a guide and to work with it. Um, this is going to be very repetitive, some of it, but I'm just going to read it to you anyway. So I have five points as to why it is important to have a living will in place. The first one is that a living will speaks for you when you are able to speak for yourself, you think of It will provide you with a peace of mind, similar to a lot of things and testaments, that you know that it's your wishes that will be carried out in the event of any contingency. <coughs> And that nobody else will make that decision for you. The loving will may also prevent your family and your loved ones from having to make a life with this decision on your behalf. And it will shield them from the medical goals that may accompany having to keep you alive on the mission. Because you will then not be able to watch your life with your life. So, as I said, there's no codified rule for living rule, but there are few ethical requirements in order to make a valid document. The first one is that you must be over the age of 18 at the time that you sign and issue your living rule. You must have the mental capacity to understand the nature and the consequences of your action when you sign the living rule, and it must be signed in the presence of two competent witnesses to the same principle of life at the same time to each other's age. On the last two pages, I did include an example of a very standard living world. 
Anyways, what I would like to point out is that your living will must be addressed to your family members in your position in your care to do by doing that at the same time. If you are not able to speak for yourself, you can, in your living will, you are allowed to refuse certain reasons. You can say, okay, um, if I'm a life support, rather speak to a life support. So, and it's important to know that that doesn't amount to the situation. Because the suspect suicide in Euthanasia is illegal in South Africa. So, your director is basically just making the disease or whatever incapacity it, it's allowing it to take its natural course. So, it won't amount to Euthanasia or assisted suicide. If, let's say, your, your medical practitioner at the time does not agree with your director as to your living room, they don't have to carry it out. What they then do is they have to submit a they are basically guided by the South African Medical Association. In this instance, because there's so many great areas for the public living room. If they don't agree with your directors, they don't have to carry your directors out. They will then give reasons as to why they're going to be a little bit of a little bit. So they will then be sick of them. If they don't feel comfortable making the decisions that you want them to make in that way. Um, so yeah, that's basically living world in a nutshell. My prerogative is to have community members who are unable to offer legal assistance for drafting the world in the living world if you would like. I'm willing to do it for free. For the community, my contact is of all this if anybody would like it. Just give me a call, pop me an email and okay. Thank you. <laughs> Michaela Jackson, um, a needle is from the handout. In case any of you would like to read uh, some uh, uh, legal law drafted, uh, uh, she was willing to do it during the session and then uh, get all the details go on to have it properly and send that to you to so a career on it and then make it a living valid work for you that you can take to your bank. Or take wherever you need to, where you would like to lodge it for it to be then, uh, executed once you get to capacitated <coughs> in the next machine. But what's important is fathers can provide for their children in a living world. Say that in a case where I'm in an accident and the child is not even the needs are that way you can tap into funds. It's unnecessary that for that period of time. A uh, person sitting without any type of uh, assistance, uh, whatever it is. Um, I saw that there were some hands up. I just want to give uh, one person, uh, two people, an opportunity to ask their questions and then get a response on it. Uh, I'm sorry that we, if there are other questions, please address it with these speakers, or uh, you can ask any of the legal person at the back that I indicated. Uh, uh, earlier to you. Peter, can you ask the that question that you wanted to ask? Okay. Uh, can, can, can you quickly just come uh, to the floor? Can you come to the floor so that uh, uh, we are four over here so that the people online can also hear? Yeah. I'll stand next to you all. I'll put your hand up. Right. 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 I want to hold my hand. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, my first question is, um, the time when I was sitting here, I was just hearing about women and women and women. But if we look at the reality, then you will see that women is actually also failing their children. And in society where we work is that we are encounter on a daily basis we grannies have to look after the children while the mother is on the sick lane. Yeah. Now the big question I'm, I want to ask is, can we also put that into the legislation? We people who eat and drugs actually not be, be not accountable. The reason for that is my thing is always if we look at women and men that is saving their responsibility that they can go and meet the drugs, they can provide a bit of money for the children. And often we, we can 
think I need to talk to the Bishop Mayor if we say that I think. And I heard Mr. Hector say to know there were a lot of people that failed to become here. But the question we need to ask, did I even have the place money to provide in the children's need to be here today? So um, we, we receive poverty on a daily basis. And it is not that people are just empowered, but we also, and the second thing is that I also want to make it connected. The um, attitude of our people as a whole speaks of negativity, especially when it comes to people that is uneducated, mm -hmm. especially if they don't know the law. I mean, I myself do not know about the law of um, lying, um, of benefit that you make. Yeah. And I want to know is the people that is at the core empowered enough to say to that lady this year, you are seven years now on four. Can you can um, ask for that money. You see, and sir, you spoke about um, the um, <laughs> the debt that you can encounter, but how many people are knowing that? You know, or they have access to the really we don't have access, or our communities don't have access. And these are the stuff that we need to take back to the society. It's not everybody that can come to Cape Town, but I would really appreciate it. I'm working in the whole of the big of the Bishop Labor area, and I would really appreciate it. Um, we are um, working in all the schools in Bishop Labor. If we can be um, communicated with our parents, Especially with parents is using this platform money to feed children while parents both a mom dad is under. Wow. You, you know, so I mean we we are raising a society now that is more in impoverished position because of parents lacking their um, their responsibility. I mean, I was a victim of 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 the poor. Of a lady in the court that told me you will need a baby. You are a good girl who is serving people that night. I closed my court case after seven years fighting on the court. And thank you, sir, that you went to India. You know, and I truly appreciate that you think that we as women need to empower ourselves. I took that, um, I took that in, um, in, in, in your trust. I'm not fighting anymore the justice system, but I'm empowering myself to uh, educate myself and I way back to school. And I say to women that today, and men, you know, we are always empowering women, but we lack the empowered men. And they are the visionaries of the house. They are the house of the people of the household. And if we even start to empower young men, then we will have a generation that is not to be. Thank you. Anyone taking care of the child. So that's why the matter is said, let us advocate for these type of changes. Now you know that that grandmother that is taking the uh, Sasa money in order to, to take care of the child, she can apply for maintenance and get both of those uh, people that have money for tips and whatever that they should do, take their responsibility serious instead of her having to waste all the Sasa money on, on her and their children. Which is our grandchildren, but still, there is a special duty on those parents. The Law Commission has a beautiful uh, section on it. I forgot the page number, but I will make sure that 21st of February I will have it in part of the agenda and make it clear as far as that is concerned. There's a provision in the Children's Act, and I thought that my colleague, Mr. Peter Ikulu, speak about it, um, and that I saw that even if we get the way. These type of orders involving aunts and uncles are being taken to the children's court. 
is this provision of care and guardianship where the children are supposed to interpret it that when the grandmother is taking guardianship of the child, it must go to the high school. That nonsense is unfortunately not going to be in the soon when the uh, Children's Development Act comes in operation, which gives the children court that extra territorial jurisdiction to make all those type of orders pertaining to a grandmother or aunt that is taking uh, care of a specific child. So, again, to hear my colleagues sit and, and get something together, and uh, then either I will present it or we'll see what happens, and then we will uh, take it from there. Uh, it's almost uh, time for us to end off. Uh, we've got one more uh, presentation to do, and that is uh, Ms. Pearl Welsh, and uh, she will do a presentation, um, and then afterwards she will do the uh, closure. Um, and uh, then we can go and have some uh, something to keep to our cafeteria. Uh, I'm just starting now to get the presentation. Uh, I've got it. Let's pull out. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Abby, for the um, Compliments of the season to all of you. Thank you. And thank you very much for all of your support. We've spoken about numerous minded topics, which all included unjust, which included safety and security and support. We spoke about the Credit Act. We spoke about broken relationships. We spoke about maintenance for mediation, living will, and the unjust within the justice system. The majority of my colleagues have covered and interrelated some of the topics that I was going to talk about. So now I need to see how we can uh, put over. Hold on. I speak from the I speak as an activist. I speak as one of the women of this maintenance group who have experienced the unjust within the justice system. I feel that we have to motivate a number of the women that feel insecure, that doesn't know how to deal with some of the issues that we are addressing. I'm grateful for this maintenance group, for the founder of this group, for the NPA to have been associated with this group in order to educate us through vast and the vast amount of knowledge and power that we are able to gain from this group. Even though it's free, thank God it's free because some of us appreciate the fact that there's all certain things in life that are free that we can learn from. Um, I've pointed out a number of uh, questions here. How do we balance our children, the emotional value and stability? Maintenance does play a key, a key role in balancing family life when you go through separation, when you go through violence, fight and abuse. Therefore, for me, I'm finding one of the issues for the courts to enforce and prioritize maintenance. I've addressed the Minister of Justice as advisor. My challenge for this year is to take upon myself and in association with a number of the groups here to try and find that we prioritize maintenance in community for people that go through divorce and balance our family lives sooner than later. Not with the delays of court processes, not with the delays of the unjust and the justice system, not with the delays of unskilled people not knowing how to treat us. The priority for me would be how do we empower ourselves? It's purely by understanding what our right is. For me, as an, as an individual person having experience. My situation, Michaela just spoke about wills. The most important part about those wills are that they are formalized with them. If that is not done correctly, you have been dealing with issues when it comes to a survival spouse, when it comes to a deceased state. I've experienced now going through maintenance as a surviving spouse. We haven't mentioned surviving spouses in the maintenance act. We haven't mentioned how to deal with maintenance in the high court. Apart from the unjust, the magistrate, the maintenance and the magistrate sure is on a different level. But there are some women, whether it comes from different lifestyles or different areas, that
that we have to deal with the justice system on different levels. And unfortunately, it is not just the uneducated um, officer in the maintenance court. We are dealing with a legal mafia within the legal system. We are dealing with people that are so embedded within the system. They come from an old school system where they support one another. I've just had a recent experience in the high court where the judge knew he was going to strike me off the record. I was aware when I walked into the registrar's office, but he still went to court for my hand to be heard. That judge clearly stated that he referred to his predecessor ruling on my matter, knowing that there was no dispute of fact that I came with all the evidence and the factual, the legal rights and the jurisdiction. So for us as women, women and men, we need to actually take the little bit of time we have to empower ourselves on the Constitution and our Bill of Rights before we go to court and understand how the system works. It's all about a system. We don't have a law. If you're not factual, if you don't understand the law, unfortunately, we get lost in the process. Lawyers, they always use legal tactics to delay the process. If you're not aware of it, you don't understand what you're doing, we are always getting the bad end of the stick. For me, what the media want to do is the key topic that stood out in the media is justice delayed is justice denied. And all the majority of the lawyers that is embedded in this legal mafia within the high court, or other courts for that matter, playing that tactic is you are being denied for this as the greatest of right. You need to know your rights before you go into the main court. court. Um, the judiciary service, I am disappointed in my personal capacity because of the ethical values within. The system from within, very sadly so, works with the lawyers, works with the advocates. You don't get past that stage if you don't know your rights and you don't know the legality behind it and if you don't structure your affidavit with formatting all what you need, outlined from the beginning. My aim is, of course, what everyone discussed, to enforce the maintenance, to get the Department of Justice to prioritize for the judiciary system, the legal system, and the judicial service to present and prioritize what is already written in the books. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. We are not trying to ask them for anything that is not written already. Like, like one of the colleagues mentioned earlier, we have one of the top legislators. We have an amazing country. We just have the wrong people running it. <laughs> we have lost the fact of humanity. People are not respecting each other. The fact that we have it all the abuse, we are having all the disrespect amongst couples is because people have lost that sense of humanity amongst each other. People have lost the sense of value and ethics. The sad part is there is no value and ethics in our legal system if we do not stand up and fight for our rights within the legal system. We look at the gender-based violence, we look at the abuse amongst women and men. How do we bring that safety and security back within our environment? I understand we have different levels of religion, culture, we have different levels of poverty, we have different levels of society. How can we stand together as a community today? Sure, we have 66 people that didn't make it. Maybe they administered and said, I would like to be there. They changed their mind. Maybe they didn't have the money to come here. They changed their mind. Yes, this is free for us to be able to empower ourselves and educate ourselves. Whatever those people are going through, our message here today is that we are able to support one another, that we're able to look at our neighbor and say, how can we help you with what we know? That is not happening in society anymore. People don't care about one another anymore. They will pass each other without saying hello, which costs us nothing. We need to bring back kindness. We need to be able to stand together and say, yes, we want constructive impact. 
We have a constitution, we have laws and we have rights. We have to be able to voice our opinion to say we want the legal justice we deserve. So I pledge to all of you here today, anyone that's been treated unjustly, I've missed my presentation because I get carried away with talking. I get carried away with what comes to mind because I like to speak freely. That if you've been treated unjustly or anybody that's been treated unjustly, I would like you to send an email so that I can compile a number of these complaints and deliver it to the Department of Justice office so that we, whether it's the MPA, whether it's uh, um, Eugene Offerman, fighting for the maintenance and all the other organizations with the NPO so that we can actually make a crack or a dent to say we stand together and we want change. I have given myself the opportunity that I will drive this project myself in order to get an answer from the minister so that he can enforce maintenance interim relief on behalf of our us of the judiciary that has to make a ruling generally within 48 hours when it comes to child, uh, um, maintenance and interim relief. They don't do that. They reserve judgment. They prejudice women. They prejudice whoever is on the other side. If you know all these rights, you are able to stand and voice your opinion. But it doesn't matter who sends you away. You say, I have a right. You stand there. You say, I'm coming back because I deserve to get the justice. You have a constitutional right to be able to go and apply to the High Court on urgent or the Magistrate Court on urgent Rule 6.12. You have to make sure it doesn't work. You have a lawyer or not. Go and apply again to make sure that whether you irritate the hell out of them, that you apply again so you have a right to be heard and for the justice you deserve. Um, Again, coming back, I'm now going to close the conference by saying thank you very much to everybody that is part of this organization. Thank you very much for bringing all the people that is able to share the knowledge and is willing to help and make a difference to society. All of you that has attended here today, thank you very much for coming. Everybody else that's on Facebook and listening on the media channel, thank you very much for being there. And thank you very much. I thank you, Jean. You organized the maintenance WhatsApp group, which I'm part of. I've seen the constructive changes, the positive outcome of what has happened since I've participated in this group. And I'm grateful for all the women that are sharing just their experiences, their knowledge, and their ability to help the others that don't know what to do. What I would like to do for the next session is try and get those books, little constitutional books from um, the Department of Justice so that we can hand it out to everyone that participates in the group so that they have just the basic knowledge and understanding of their rights. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Until the 25th of February, we look forward to the next Empowered Motivation. And thank you for all your help. God bless you.